Morning, Jefferson. Uh, Honorable Singh, good morning. How are you? It's Sorry, so I had my microphone in, uh, plugged in. I didn't realize that. <laughs> oh, okay. Good You're to keeping have well, you. and all the colleagues are keeping well. Yes, and then you had a nice uh, gathering over the weekend down there. Yeah, it's very, very nice. Went off very well, thanks. You are an amazing nation, eh? Phillips, I've mentioned your name as well. Where um, are yeah. you? The first one, yes. And then we have the two apologies of Honorable Gancho and Honorable Mbata Usik. Gancho will join us and when she learns, 
she's going to join the meeting. Honorable Mkuni is also in the meeting. Good morning. Yes. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Yes. I think then we are all here. Then I want to take this opportunity to welcome also the delegation led by the DM together with the acting DG, Ms. Bendeman and the, the other senior managers that are here from the department to also welcome the chairperson of the board of the Isimangalisa Wetland Park together with the CEO and the other senior managers from the entity that are here. Also to welcome the chairperson of the board of the South African Weather Services together with the CEO and other senior managers that are here. Like I've indicated, that we have the apology of the minister and the DG. Then the min DG, as per the minister's request, as you have seen when we'll be dealing with the committee program, we had to bring in Ismangali, so in the weather service today, because as per the request of the minister, because the DG is a witness in another case that is got to do with environmental matters in Houting. So she had to be in court the whole of this week. Hence, we had to quickly then rearrange with uh, the weather service and Ismangali, so to be the ones that um, start. And then I should think I need to thank the two chairpersons of the two entities, including their CEOs. When we, we wanted them to then chip in, they didn't hesitate. And then they even send us their documentation on time. We want to appreciate you colleagues for that. Having said that, this is the agenda for today. This is how we're going to, to proceed. Can I have a mover in the second of the agenda? Chairperson, I move. I will second it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, colleagues. Having done that, can we then ask uh, that you fly the committee program quickly? Yes, Chair, I am fighting it. Chair? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's on the screen. It's on the screen, the item one is already passed by. We are here today. And I believe this was shared with you also in advance. Can I get uh, comments, inputs before we move for the adoption? I want to see the hands. Honorable this is your Microphone is on. Is it a hand or historical one? Honorable Singh, I'll recognize you for now. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, no, no, the, the program seems fine. I don't know whether the engagement for the 30th, uh, whether that needs to be put on here. Is it going to be an official engagement, the screening of lion bones and bullets? Uh, because I've taken the liberty as well to <clears throat> invite on your behalf and my behalf the minister as well and the other portfolio committee uh, person. So I don't know if you if we want to put it in here or not, but uh, I'm still okay. We received a number of uh, uh, responses from our colleagues saying that they will attend on the 30th, which we sincerely appreciate. Thank you. Okay, we can put it there. Uh... Chileka, let's edit. Any other end? 
vulnerable brains. Thanks, Chairperson. It's it's uh, actually just a sort of inquiry in terms of the oral submissions for the climate change bill. Um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that's that's going to be in a in a virtual format. Um, but maybe Tilek or yourself, uh, I'm not sure who's best placed, can just explain um, how that process will um, take place, just so we are aware and we can plan um, accordingly. You know what the timeframes are, etc. Um, I think it's quite important for us to to establish that. Thanks. Okay. I had asked because of the voluminous uh, submission that we have on the climate change that they must then create a Google uh, account wherein all of you can then yeah, access those submissions prior to that. The other thing I was planning that we need to meet at that level, all of us as committee members and strategize how are we going to approach it. But we had to put it in the program. I still owe you that meeting, all of you in we're going to sit and strategize how are we going to approach it. But it had to be put in the program. Those other issues were going to end them, all of us together. How are we going to go about whether we need to do physical or virtual, all those sorts of things we'll have to take that decision ourselves. I hope that suffice. Chair, Chairperson, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the issue of the joint meeting with uh, agriculture, uh, where are we on that one? On the animal welfare? That's the other item I want us to discuss, all of us. Uh, can you plead with me so that we discuss that one as well? Because I think on our part, we've tried to do what we could do. But the other colleagues seem to be having their other priorities. Can we then also discuss it? How are we going to move forward on that one as well? It's an item that is there. That's the issue that I said in our meeting that we're going to hold. We need to outside the committee program to discuss it as well as a committee. Is it okay, Honorable Singh? That's fine, Chairperson, that's fine, thank you. Okay, then, yeah, as and when we'll be do, yeah, we'll, when we are doing the public hearings, I think we'll find time. For those who won't be with us, then we can arrange a, a Zoom a thing after the hearing, one of the days next week. This week is this week, yes. Okay. You noting the items selected that should form part of that consultative meeting that we normally hold with the various parties. Yes, yes, okay. the main committee. Okay. Okay. okay, it's fine. Any other issue? I'm chair, my hand is up. It's Cheryl Phillips. Okay. Yeah, um, yes, I'd, I'd like to um, second what Honourable Singer said, and I'm very concerned that that um, our other colleagues are not coming back to us on the animal um, welfare. Uh, that, that's the first thing. The second thing is there's no report back anywhere on the high-level panel for St Lucia and what is actually happening there at the moment. Um, I, I think we really need to get that on board as well, um, to have a, a report back on that as well as the uh, animal welfare colloquium. Thank you very much. Okay, noted. Yeah, that's it. Okay, then. Having you raise all those issues, can I get a mover in the second for the adoption of this program? I move Honorable Jefferson Singh. Honorable Singh has moved. I second. Seconder. Honorable Tuno has seconded. Hey, you are like me. Can you set your camera issue, Honorable King? Let's proceed. Okay. 
then you see a CEO of East Mangal is the can you assess honorable Mkuno, please? Sorry to my again, Chairperson. I wanted you to assist her with your camera then. <laughs> the background <laughs> thing. <laughs> can you see what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, Chairperson. I can't help, unfortunately. Can't help. <laughs> okay, <laughs> colleagues. I shall think then uh, you have seen from today's agenda that uh, have been circulated, including the one that we have adopted now, that today we are going to deal with the third and fourth quarter performance and experts nature report of these two entities. Maybe before that, we have a visitor here in our midst. Uh, he's Mr. James Lech. He's a doctoral candidate from Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Department of Radiology and Nuclear Medicine. Uh, we have been directed by the House Chair to process the, this report of the World Health Organization on its 2022 optical radiation and EMF research findings as it pertains to our country. So that's why uh, we have put this item in the agenda and we want to welcome you, uh, Mr. Lech. Uh, you're welcome. Maybe if you can show your video so that the colleagues can then see you if you put on your camera. I said struggle on honorable Mkuno there. It's hectic. Honorable Chairperson, my camera is active. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Okay. So colleagues, I was still thank you so much. I will give you an opportunity to make your presentation. I was still talking to the colleagues who haven't met for quite some time. And then to say that we are going to also deal with the third and fourth quarter performance expenditure and expenditure reports for the two entities, that is our Ismangaliso Wet Park Authority and the South African Weather Service. Although we all know this is not a presentation of these uh, two entities' annual reports, and then I should believe as and when we engage with them, we're going to then get a fair assessment of the entire performance as we will expect them to present uh, to us the outcomes of their respective post audit management intervention that we've been following for some time now. We could also see that the audit results or opinions are out now, although we don't know whether these are squeaky clean audits or they are findings until we engage with the AG after the tabling of the annual reports in Parliament. I must report colleagues, uh, I was fortunate to be invited by the House Chair on Friday with some of the chairperson of the committees for us to go and meet with the Auditor General. And then, yeah, there were some of the highlights on these entities, but in that meeting that I said they were going to meet, we'll be able to share with you what has been the AG's observations. But now, in the meantime, I think whatever we are going to get from these two entities, it's going to then uh, tell us what to expect. Then, we, as I've indicated, uh, Mr. Lech is here. He's going to present uh, this report of the World Health Organization to us. And uh, the report was referred to us by the House Chairperson. And then, when one goes through this, one thinks that this report should have been sent at least to the Portfolio Committee on Health, also Science and Technology, or the Portfolio Committee on Communications, which deals with the licensing of telecommunication towers or facilities. Which one could believe they are responsible for generating this electro electromagnetic field 
and associated uh, radiation. And then at least then one could also expect regulatory practitioners such as ICASA, the Department of Health and Metropolitan Municipalities to monitor, study, regulate, or implement a national electro electromagnetic field radiation exposure protection standard. But it seems this is not the case. And then I should think a uh, DDG and DM, we might need to ask yourself as our own department about your competency with regard to this EMF radiation exposure. Colleagues, I also seem to also wonder whether there is some perception out there that we are the ones who actually make things happen. That's why maybe things are sent to you colleagues, in particular this uh, technical report. I'm not trying to dismiss you, Mr. Lech, but these are the issues that I felt when we were going through that report one stage to look at. And then another puzzling thing for me is the fact that a World Health Organization project report of this nature was seemingly never tabled at this committee. Consequently, I asked the committee secretary to contact the originator of this report, uh, Mr. Lech, who's from Busie in Nawamist, and to come here. And then uh, when he did that, then he the response that came was that the report has got everything to do with the environment, especially in terms of policy making. So, Mr. Lesh, you need to stick to that, and then you're going to introduce yourself properly. And then as you are here to, pro to present this report, and probably you'll highlight its implications to us uh, for as this committee, including the work that we do as this committee. And I should think for the colleagues from Isamangaliso and the Sawis, maybe there's something that you might benefit out of that. Just bear with us as I end over to Mr. Lech to do the presentation. Over to you, Mr. Lech. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Please allow me to do the share screen. Right. Good morning, everybody. My name is James Lech. I am a diplomatic science officer. I actually have many things. And to start off very quickly, I would not be here today if it was not for a lot of the works of your yourselves, your team members, your predecessors, uh, because I am South African. I am a government official. And I uh, act on many different uh, elements or areas. And to give some uh, clarities, yes. So it's either I'm not employed by the World Health Organization. I am the selected uh, and elected uh, representative for South Africa to presenting to uh, the World Health Organization International Advisory Committee. Uh, so with me, I'm, like I said, diplomatic science officer. What that means is a person who takes at yourself to write a policy and help provide the filling in gaps of the technical elements to a policy, the parameters, and vice versa. So it's a, a bit of both hats here. Uh, at the same time, uh, funded by the South African government per our bilateral agreements. I'm currently in the Netherlands where I'm doing my doctorate. I just finished up my post at Frey University. It's the Faculty of Science, meaning Physics for Living Systems and Biophysics, a Department of Physics and Astronomy and Lasers, uh, also Science and Business Innovation Unit, and finishing up a post now at the Amsterdam Medical Center, Department of Radiology and Nuclear Medicine, uh, specializing in MRI and EEG. Some quick uh, background or, or clearances thing. Please keep in mind that I am disabled, so I do have a number of disabilities. Uh, one of them is I make use of a guide service dog, so I'll go into some history of myself and explanation to this presentation. Another part of my disability is uh, my neurological impairment where I have uh, Asperger's or autism. This 
means that I literally do not see the world as everybody else here in the committee. And also I do, my brain does not work in a linear format. So if I do say certain words that might be offensive or certain elements, please do not take this personally. It is that my brain is unable to compute nuance. Um, so that's just to elements, but we are running on time and I am going to make this as fun as possible and more exciting and invigorating and not diving too much into the boring technical science elements. However, everything is available. So what happens is what this uh, annual report is and how it works with your committee and not just your committee, but other committees and departments in South Africa is that every year there's an international advisory committee uh, to which that it's kind of uh, involving environment, climate change and health and involves areas of air pollution, washing, cleaning, solid waste, climate change, radiation, chemicals. And it does pertain to, uh, to us because it's kind of this annual meeting is similar to the Olympics. Uh, every country around the world will go and do projects, do research, develop policies. And these countries then come together uh, focusing on how can we compete with each other of advising the best policies and, and methods going forward. So it's not about taking advice directly from the WHO because we have a discussion, but rather to inspire others. And that's why it's a great pride every year to present this national report uh, because we are showing off the pride of South Africa and the pride of South Africa sharing on our solutions around the world. Uh, so this is why I work in different parts of the world, uh, doing different parts. As we said that this meeting uh, was put by a chairperson um, to which then it was reviewed within um, 22 hours by eight, nine different uh, persons from around the country, uh, which is gr a great importance. But very important, again, as I said, this is not just about um, optical radiation and environment, but actually it's about encompassing multiple areas. And this is why I deal in medicine, agriculture, climate change, and disabilities. And this report was uh, composed by a committee of representatives from um, professors to South African Human Rights Commission, um, South African Police Services, uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, State Veterinarians, uh, South African Medical Research Council. So it's trying to work as much as possible and growing the committee of having more and more voices as possible. Uh, this year as well, we had a Nobel contributor, which was Ivan Kulyak, who was the co-recipient for the Nobel Prize of Peace in 2013 for his contribution to the works of prohibition of chemical weapons. But so where this comes in is that this report is not the report or voice or views of I, James Lech. It is the voice of South Africa. So before I can even present any of this, it has to be agreed and reviewed by a whole committee and, it, and subcommittees and other hierarchy committees. Reason why this is important or, or the base theory of why it comes to you as committee here is that we focus on the life and universe and how everything is created. And as we have in Genesis uh, Old Testament, um, God said, let there be light and light came about in all creation, all life, everything that we experience, weather, climate, all comes from this one uh, element. And that's why in the report, we focus on light and education, understanding of light first, because we understand that then we had this famous person here, uh, Professor or Dr. Albert Einstein, who got a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Prize in medicine or physics or science doesn't mean an absolute law. It just means a general consensus among scientific community at that time. And what Albert Einstein did was he um, took sort of his Jewish historical learnings and uh, Judeo-Christianity, and he decided to create a mathematical model to describe nature and the effects. And these uh, models were the Stark-Einstein law, uh, and a bunch of other different ones. And what we got from this is taking these wonderful, complex or counterintuitive mathematical equations. And in the report, we repeatedly provide demonstrations of it in practical applications. And that's what I'm gonna do today. I'm gonna go through a whole bunch of different uh, practical applications of different solutions around the world done by ourselves and South Africans and the partners from around the world. So what's very important here is that what I do is I take very much, uh, very literally because of my disability is that it's not really possible for me to lie. And I take what is written to be sort of true and follow it and test it. And through this whole process, I'll come to the history is 
taking a negative, so what a person says is bad for us or negative experience, and turning it into positive. And this is why it's very key important what uh, the late uh, President Mandela did with his uh, administrative team was helping generate this Batupela principle. So even when there is a complaint and there is um issue we must make sure to to spark this positive action this this comes very very true and i'll give you an example of, of what happened uh to me so in 20, 2011 2012 i had a stroke during mri scan uh come a few years later 2018 i unfortunately was the uh, victim of a uh, disability attack on me by some parties and where they created false criminal charges um and then also paid the police to commit a horrible act upon me where I then had my second stroke. Uh, having a second stroke, I lost, uh, I lost the function, half function of my body, unable to speak, uh, unable to work. And I had my two small children at the time. I now have four children. So what happened was my neurologist told me, uh, James, uh, we are, um, cannot really do much for you. Um, you know, if you're lucky, you might see some positive response or some recovery in about nine months in a stress-free environment. And this is not really possible. But what he did do, he knew my background, knew my history and, and, and uh, the work I researched. And he said, why don't you maybe go back to your research and maybe you can find a solution? And this is where I then went back to um, looking at my research. I looked at the elements of Einstein, Albert Einstein and thinking, how can I apply these mathematical models in practical application? So this was a nice Dutch article. It looked at uh, where I'm demonstrating using nature as much as possible before clinical intervention. So what, like I said, had my stroke, could not walk, could not function, using nature, this is me three and a half months later, uh, and over 95% recovery. There at the bottom is my guy's service dog, Pebble. And here we are in the Western Cape, as I said, my family and I were living below the bread line, uh, literally sort of begging for assistance. And we did not have money to actually go buy food in the supermarket. And I literally had to hunt for mussels in, in our oceans, in our waters. And I, I got a very good close reaction with this. And I would be in this cold water here using light water magnetism as taught by nature to stimulate my recovery and regeneration. And yes, I was very, uh, did get a permit from your uh, fisheries department. And even I was very kind that one of your inspectors did come and check the, the, uh, imp uh, the license for me for fishing these mussels. But through this experience of nature, I grow, grew a very strong uh, respect for marine life, uh, nature and fisheries and thinking, how can we use this to help others further? What happened was then, um, through the work and uh, different neurologists, I was refer developing these new treatment protocols for different diseases uh, in South Africa. And this is one of our uh, deputy ambassadors who was in hospital for over a year. And he was uh, sent to me uh, after being abroad for so long in hospital and sent back to South Africa telling that he must put his affairs in order because he's going to pass away in a few months. Uh, being referred to me, I designed his treatment protocol. And this is him six months later on the right. Uh, within three months, he was back at his post abroad, carrying on serving South Africa and not uh, having us the burden cost to the state of South Africa. So this then took us further, uh, again, using nature, how can we use it? How can we turn this environment and forestry uh, and marine life into something of practical medical application? So I was fortunate enough to uh, then be referred to this man here. Some of you might recognize him, uh, any of the ministers who have been to one military hospital in the last number of years. This is Lieutenant General Aubrey Sadibi of the South African Defense Force, kind of like in a way the president's doctor, where uh, he had some background in quantum biology and he gave a declaration request uh, along with members from parliament for me to help uh, design new teaching curriculum for medical students, help improve soldier recovery program. But very important, the work and the work that you do as your committee is the requirement that our involvement using nature as much as possible and how we uh, do bioadaptation to these elements of climate change is an area of national defense and national security. And this is quite keen important. Um, so this is why originally I was meant to go to Germany to help design a new power grid systems from AC to DC uh, because it, with renewable energy, we want to have more close impact to persons. 
uh, but unfortunately I had my stroke and I was not able to go to Germany anymore. However, uh, having received uh, reviews from and different members of South Africa Executive working together and also coming across the review of the National Research Foundation of Mrs. Dube, who was directing reviews, uh, she did reach out to me and said, listen, uh, Mr. Lech, uh, I understand what you're doing, I understand your history, and I want to recommend you that you be part of our bilateral agreement program uh, for South Africa. And this bilateral agreement program actually has a history of science diplomacy thanks to the works of the late Bishop, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So what uh, Mr. Dubey had the idea of feeling was what Albert Einstein did for um, the Vatican. So I don't know if you know, but uh, John Paul Pope II, the late Paul Pope, whenever he would teach his congregation, he had to have them experience the environment first and change the environment to have them have a strong connection with God. And essentially, this is what we see in history that um, leaders of the community or public is that diplomatic science must be able to connect science and the people together. And this is what sort of happened with um, the late Desmond Tutu, that uh, he gave an award for his uh, Professor Rink van Gronen on quantum biology, of looking at these very complex elements and light harvesting and photon synthesis and plants and nature and renewable energy and how they can all come together. And this is then where it came uh, to review of my work and my application ideas of being very multidisciplinary of how we can bring everything together. And again, it's, it's the idea of taking what Albert Einstein uh, was saying. So what the theme is, and the theme of this report uh, that, we, that we chose for, for this year was in 1942, Professor Albert, Dr. Albert Einstein was giving a lecture at uh, Oxford University. And at this uh, lecture, uh, his assistants called him and said, uh, Professor Einstein, um, for this examination, why have you given the exact same exam question paper as the previous year? Uh, and he, Professor Einstein said, because it's, it's valid, that this is why I'm doing it. And the assistant say, was puzzled and he digested the idea and he said, no, but uh, Professor Einstein, this is unethical. You cannot give students the exact same exam question as the previous year. And Professor Einstein looked at him and said, uh, my dear man, it is valid to give the same questions because the answers have changed. And this is the exact same thing is that with the advancements we have had in science and which we had, I'm gonna show you illustrations today, the questions that were in 1942 are the same as today, but the answers have changed. And very important that if we think we're going to move forward doing the same thing we did last year or the years before and get a different result, we are mistaken. And instead, by we have to do things differently and we can apply these mathematical models to vastly accelerate this process to getting significantly different results, which I'll be showing you today. We are mistaken. Um, so let's have some, by we have some key fun things, things, things right with it. So as I said, the there's this mathematical model, vast accelerate and this process. This is getting demonstrated by NASA, results, which just I'll by changing the light bulb. Um, which I'm going to so show let's you have some pictures here. Some you are able to get significant. So as I said, there's this mathematical model, vast accelerate this process. And we use less electricity by NASA. So never mind that the light bulb, you know, changing water, fertilizer none of those elements changed we only changed light and this is just a few photons a few uh, milliwatts of power that one would normally think and the thing is that we are all led to believe that these white energy efficient light bulbs are better for you this has been completely debunked and instead if you use the incorrect lighting you're going to get significantly uh, um, different in, in plant growth so how we change the light, in especially like a street light or hospital lights or your building lights, uh, our parliament lights will give very different effects on how nature is going to bioadapt to these changes. And again, this works on tomato, soybean control. It's a very wide variety. So I'm going to give you an example as well here. This is what I did in the Netherlands uh, social housing project, where uh, we went from a, where's that picture now? Give me a second.
So what we did here in this uh, social housing project is this is the control. This was using an 11 watt light bulb. That's your, the typical light bulbs LED that was installed in the public space areas of the social housing project. And what I did is I changed for a different light bulb. There was four watts. And what you see on the right here is a new growth that occurred. So this plant over here, this is the control. This is at um, no, set, uh, at um, uh, 11 watts of power or light bulb. This is using a four watt light bulb, right? So this is over a span of three weeks, significant growth in the plants and development, again, versus the control of just changing the light bulb. So this is significantly important because in South Africa, we're doing all these uh, rollouts. And as some of you are aware, with issues with climate and environment, uh, there is a legislation in EU where which lights are installed and regulations is very important uh, for affecting wildlife, affecting uh, nature, resilience. And instead of having this wonderful orange color lighting, uh, we're having this horrible white lighting. And on top of that, even further, that even though it's solar panel, it's significantly reducing the amount of growth we can have in nature. And even for our public uh, municipal systems, uh, the technical parameter is that when they order this light uh, from China, is that they do not order the uh, microchip that allows the enabling of the system. So as a municipality, they may spend 5 million Rand on rolling out a whole bunch of lights, but then because they did not ask for the one correct microchip to be installed, in order to fix the issue, it's going to cost another 5 million Rand to replace all of them. So again, what I have to do is we think of what NASA says of a scientific technical analysis, meaning what is a simple solution? So as we talked in our course, this is me in France uh, and also in the Netherlands, we do it in South Africa as well, using simple orange PVC plastering tape, the same type of tape you use for, um, for, for, for like you're painting your house, you're changing this horrible bright, uh, white light to a more different light that stimulates plant growth, but also helps people feel very relaxed. So in this Lara Union project, uh, there was a decrease in alcohol consumption, decrease in noise complaints, and decrease in uh, drug consumption in that area. And all we did was use uh, something very existing, uh, using, uh, it was about 80 Rand for 55 meter roll of tape. And we are now in compliance with EU regulations of the correct spectrum of light to be used at nighttime. Again, yeah, very simple, very pragmatic. Um, and then moving on, where again is this for, for South Africa and why is it important? So in the, in the um, report, we paid homage to the late Luc Montagnier. For those who do not know, Luc Montagnier got the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2008 uh, for HIV. And he passed away a couple of months ago. Uh, but what's very important is that his work is what actually spelt the development in the Equality Act of South Africa, that we have recognition for HIV and AIDS and protection around it. What's also very important, this is where we got um, Professor Doug Wallace, who got the Franklin Award, Provincial the Nobel uh, Prize Award, is that we have two things called uh, mitochondrial DNA. And what's very important in South Africa, about 50-50 of this. Uh, so we have Professor uh, Himmler Studio. She got the South African Pre uh, President's Award for contributions to this work. And it's not about the skin color appearance, but we do a simple DNA test. And depending on which one you have, how you use nature will have a significant output change in HIV resi resilience and AIDS resilience and, and even treatment. So we, we use the simple way of doing it. We look at what's already on the market. So for example, FNB, if you're an FNB member, uh, with eBucks, they have one of these things called 22 uh, Me. It's like DNA test, and this helps give composition. What's important though, is depending on which um, DNA you have, if you're a coupled or uncoupled haplotype, it's two very broad ca ca categories. In South Africa, about 50-50. So what it means is that me as an uncoupled haplotype, uh, at the end of summer, I should have a target range of blood tests of 60 to 80 nanograms per mole. So that's when you have your regular blood tests, you go to the doctor, and this is where you should be. However, with the shifting baseline syndrome or the issue we have in South African environment, majority of persons is over here. However, on the other side, uh, like a coupled haplotype, so this is like your core and your sand, they're meant to have levels close to 200 nanograms per, per millimeter. 
So what this means is, is that we having a type of coded bias um, occurring. Um, so example coded bias, this was a Netflix documentary where parliament got involved for drastically changing how we see data, how we must treat data and how we must do the effect on women and medicine that we are applying here. So to give you a, a pragmatic example, all right? Uh, couple, uncoupled haplotide, that's me. So I'm in the ice bath here. Uh, and I'm able to be in the cold water for long periods of time, and I'm able to boost my DNA and health very, very well. However, coupled haplotype cannot do this or get ill. And instead, the example is by in Rwanda, where one is actually able to use, the, you need to use the sun and water differently to get uh, a, a, another different uh, medical result uh, for a person. So we wanted to use components of light water magnetism as much as possible, to improve the outcome for someone. So this is, uh, for example, for us in our uh, course we taught at the beginning of the year uh, as Introduction to Submolecular Medical and Agricultural Sciences. And we have two of our professors here, uh, one from Nigeria, one from Hungary, and they're demonstrating how uh, this task of brushing your teeth in the morning outside actually helps make your teeth whiter. So again, getting in that solar sun and helping protect your skin from uh, UV photons so you can absorb them better but having your belly and abdomen in the sun is very, very critical. And particularly because this is the most powerful and cheapest way of getting a probiotic. It's also very important because in South Africa, we're having these policies for STEM, where we're wanting to have women in power, uh, executive positions, uh, education, STEM, science, and everything else. However, what we understand from mitochondrial DNA is that if we do not adapt the environment to what women need, most of them are getting autoimmune diseases and cannot get to their position of power or maintain their position of power. And the reason is, is that in the brain, you have something called uh, the leptin receptor. And this is kind of, everyone knows this a yellow weaver bird and the male would make the bird. And then the, if the female's not happy with it, she would destroy it and have them grow it again and again. So what happens here is that this is explains why men, it's very easy for them to lose weight, but for women, it's not. And the reason is, one of the reasons is that this leptin receptor in the brain is an evolutionary mechanism that if the environment is not well for you, if it's not compatible, you are more easily will put on inflammation weight or get, or get fatter. And it's a biological system. This is why we know with Oprah Winfrey, she struggled away for many years. And when she makes adjustments to using this, uh, making a leptin receptor more sensitive, then the weight lose, uh, flies off very easily. So this is stuff that we learn and we need to change the AI or bias of coding to be different in order to get these very different results. Um, so these are all very important facets. Let's go to some more practical examples of very easy taking single ideas. So that's the stuff of Albert Einstein, complicated mathematics into practical application. So one of these things is called nanobubbles, all right? So we're taking... Um, this is me in France, right? So I'm in here in, the, in like a little pond. You cannot see anything to the bottom. A horrible algae and a whole bunch of other un, unneeded item. And all I did was take a simple uh, couple of rand PVC tube pipe and attach it to the existing water pump system. So what happens is we, we change what's called the electrical potential, electrical energy inside the, the water. So we're making these type of bubbles that's occurring and we're changing the magnetism in it. And the water starts becoming clearer. This is after 24 hours over here. This is after 48 hours. This is on day three. What's very important here is that we can zoom in and see this is the old root system that's not doing very well. That's been like that for months. Yes, I like. Yes. Yes. Uh, you remember we had given you 30 minutes that's going to end in the next uh, three minutes uh, and then the issue is here so that we, we are hearing this we have received your presentation then maybe tell us what are your expectation for us as the committee as i've indicated earlier that you said you are going to answer that and then we are also we are raising this to say that we are doing that when we're saying what is your expectation for this committee, mm -hmm. considering that you are vacillating between health and energy. Yes, so as and when with the remaining time, if you can do that to say. 
Thank what you. is your expectation for this committee? I think it will assist a, a great deal. Remember, I posed the question to you and how you were feeling this report was supposed to have been redirected to the other portfolios that I raised earlier. Yes. But then you said, no, there's also some responsibility coming to this community. So assist us so that we are able to then process this report right. accordingly. You. Can you use the remaining time? The rest, we go to your presentation on time. We've gone through that. And then I raised those issues after having read the report. Yes. Yeah. Then you said it's got everything to do with the environment, yes. especially in terms of policy making. Correct. So assist us so that we are able to then conclude on this matter. Oh. Thank you. I'll give you five minutes yeah. to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Chairperson. Um, I do raise the issue that we did start late, but I will go to the very crux of the very end of it. Uh, very simply, what is expected of this report is getting feedback from um, the issues that, and problems that's being faced or challenges being faced by your committee. As of last year, uh, the Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee of Health raised a big issue of the National Health Insurance uh, Act and, and policies trying to go forward but not having the funds and capacity to do it. Um, so what was one of the feedback is how can we make things simpler, more practical, that any citizen at the ground level can make a significant difference? And how can we uh, implement these into technical parameters that can assist members? And what we ask, or and also what I ask, is that any of these things that we demonstrate in the presentation is that members of this committee actually just go out and try themselves because only by experiencing the science can one begin to understand it's much easier to roll out the practical application. So even like we have here, uh, and I'm gonna to get to the climate part that's very important, that's critical to South Africa and does not affect majority of the rest of the world. Even just changing the simple light bulb, as I explained, uh, and this is any, um, any South African can do, you can see a significant difference in the grass. This is in a drought area, lots of felt fires uh, in South Africa. Uh, that's very prone to it. And same watering, same, no fertilizer, no manure being used. You can see the before and after just by changing a light bulb and less energy consumption. So what the idea here and challenges is that even just how we use um, our plants or agriculture, and even like with the whole heat issue we do for climate and forestry, uh, per Charles Collins, in his backyard, we have a small system and versus his front door, there's a five to eight degrees Celsius temperature difference. Um, I'm going to go to another one uh, quickly, briefly, and then go to the other final point, is that one does not have to plant uh, 10,000 trees, uh, to try, which is very labor intensive. For example, in this, uh, I'm calling a, a volcano here, we have a CO2 vent. I am fitting currently in there with a the project, 10,000 trees using microalgae. So even with the complaints like the climate change bowl of coal power plants and wanting to put taxations, we are able to use nature uh, to actually make a coal power plant 100% carbon neutral in under 12 months because we've done the science and research. Even SA breweries, we don't have to overtax the consumer. We can rather uh, carbon sequestrate the CO2 emissions from making uh, beer, for example, into high levels of oxygen, which will change the environment. Part of why this is important, and this comes down to one key diagram, and which I'm sure the SA Weather Service can corroborate, is that this is a satellite image from NASA looking at a magnetic field of Earth. And what we had here is a magnetic field anomaly, meaning this drop over uh, South America. This, over the last course of years, has been shifting over. This is a forecast for 2025, but this has been now covering the Western Cape. And this is not only uh, impacting less sun that we're receiving, but our ability to bioresist to natural climatic environments. And even though we will see less severe storms on land, we will have more severe storms over the water. So our fishermen and persons going out will be at higher risk. But this type of change, um, making the bill that is being proposed is not going to make much of a dent in this. And this is explained by Nobel physicist Richard Feynman, how the mathematical model has to be used as different to what has been presented or advised to the minister. And this is why in the report we proposed a hybrid model, 
And these different interventions we have is going to make a significant difference to South Africa. Uh, for us to thinking of what's going the next 10, 15 years forward, but we need to act more quickly. And that's why suits are very pragmatic. What's key is that your WHO regions or other countries are not going to give a cooking interest or, or, or worry about what's happening here because they're experiencing a different lifestyle, different effect to what, what is happening over South Africa at the moment. So all these different solutional pragmatic stuff is things that persons can do straight away in their own environments very quickly. Uh, even when we just have you uh, going to very clean water, uh, but something that I would advise, um, again, when there's a technical policy or technical element, uh, and you have like a giant data center that we have in South Africa for the fourth industrial revolution, we rather have to apply things differently where we can take this entire data center here, meaning no wind turbines needed, no cooling stations, and you can actually compress it into a single tanker and put it into our, uh, into our oceans, and we can use our existing uh, South African Defense Force and submarine naval base to ensure safety and security while making changes to the environment. Um, so every time with each policy and environment, my recommendation is when we bring our portfolio committees together, we are able to um, actually enable, um, so an example here, we had cancer treatment that was uh, and, and elements that was introduced by Nelson Mandela, but the machine was too expensive. So instead, we already done in South Africa, we have this wonderful thing where we use magnets to help ward off shocks, and we'll do the same type of treatments for here. So the question or the, the elements to, to you, Honorable Chairperson, and to the committee is, we wanting to have more dialogue and wanting to uh, give a booster of having the environment uh, technical elements of the policies being uh, expanded upon further and into these practical applications because these would significantly infect the health and performance of our South Africans. So even just the simple thing of you eating mushrooms and leaving out in the sun during the day increases your units of from 40 to 46,000. When we have uh, UV sea light is 267,000. So what that means is that in order for South Africans to really understand and want to excite more, we want them to be part of it. We want them to experience and want to see it. And even proposed the committee that was approached by the producers who did uh, I'm Not Your Guru, uh, Tony Robbins, is let us actually produce a series implementing these solutions, different solutions in South Africa very quickly with our own members of parliament in order to fast track this growth and development change in South Africa. That's, that's uh, and I think I've just come over the, the mark you gave, Honorable Chairperson. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You... Then can I get the hands? I see the first hand is that one of Honorable Singh. Over to you, Honorable Singh. No, no, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and thank you, Mr. Lech, for the presentation. Uh, Chairperson, I think you asked an appropriate question. Uh, how can our committee get involved, and how, you know, how can we contribute to, you know, making the planet a better place and a uh, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, a place uh, to that we can deal with issues of climate change, etc. What I would like to suggest, uh, Honourable Chairperson, is that our researchers take this presentation, go through it and talk to researchers of other departments, whether it's health and, and other committees, and come up with a report to us at some stage on exactly what is required of our committee. I was expecting, in fact, when, when, when I saw this report, I said, well, let me ask Mr. Lech a question about 5G. Because, you know, as environment, we get questions from people saying, well, you know, 5G is going to be harmful, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're moving into this 4IR. Uh, you know, and that's radiation. But I, I didn't hear that. But perhaps, you know, Chairperson, you know, I, I'm suggesting our researchers look into the presentation and, and come up with something uh, more specific for us after consulting other committees. Thank you. Honorable Chairperson, if I may answer the question with your permission. Wait a bit, wait a bit. I'll let you know. I'll give you an opportunity. There's another hand. Honorable Bryant, over to you. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks very much, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, I, I have to be honest, I, I, I did struggle. I was concentrating quite hard, but I, I did struggle a little bit to, to follow 
the presentation. Um, so I may have missed a couple of, of things, but um, I, I also am, am struggling to see the specific reference to to our committee and 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 what we are undertaking here. Um, I, I just also want to find out from from Mr. Leck. I, I see he's mentioned that he's a he's a government official. Um, if you can just expand a little bit in terms of that, I see there was a picture of the diplomatic passport um, on the presentation of that. Um, what what department is 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 funding this this program that he's that he's currently a, a part of? Um, and then just a little bit more on 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 your training as well, Mr. Lake, in terms of you know your your sort of academic background and and, and specialisations in this um, would be helpful as well. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Bryant. Those were the two ends. Then I can hand over to you, Mr. Lake. Thank you, Honourable Chairperson. And thank you. Uh, uh, committee members with your questions. I shall go to the first question, which was the expectancy on 5G um, and uh, and safety elements and how it also pertains to policy. So with 5G, uh, 5G is an invisible light. 5G in terms of um, it being safe or not safe, it all depends on the how it's in installed and how it's monitored and configured. Uh, and also what's very important is that in South Africa, us having the two types of DNA types uh, or broadly of coupled uncoupled, the impacts of 5G on them or bioadaptation to them as a climate change factor is also very different. This is why the Surgeon General uh, for the Defense Force uh, asked him to develop treatment protocols for the different two because what is done for our soldiers and the exposure to this high radiation by, uh, environments, because 5G has been used in the military for a number of, for a long time, is uh, how it affects them differently in terms of weight gain, performance, and, and treatment. So, in terms of uh, 5G, if you have it transmitted by itself, uh, it's it's fine. It's not transmitting, but the moment you start having more and more persons connecting to it, that's where the labels significantly raise, and also different configurations have very different impacts. And this is why part of my task is also I've been developing new teaching curriculum for medical students and professionals in biophysics so they can better understand what symptoms or organs are affected by these different spectrums of radiation and how do we do diagnosis and treatment differently and accordingly. So from a, um, and that's what we put in the report, we, we did cite Telecommunications Act, we did cite very specifically what is required in getting an cost so licensed per the ECOS's website, that any site, this is any site in South Africa, that when they do a licensed application or want to install transmitters, they have to provide the full and technical requirements. So what is the, the, the product? What is the output? What is the angle? What's the positioning? Kind of like when you build a building. And how much invisible light is being output from it. And we plug this into G G GIS, Geographic Information Systems, like we uh, use a lot in environments. And from that, we create what's called a 3D propagation model. And from that, we help avoid uh, mismarketing and, and, and pseudoscience and other claims because we're no longer having uh, looking for a needle on a haystack. We actually use very uh, good technology and solutions to help pinpoint where there are localized hotspots and how we can configure these transmitters differently. Uh, because there's no way from no means of getting away from 5G. And also we have it from satellites as well, which is increasing. And we have to uh, bioadapt to it differently. And this radiation is going to affect wildlife, plant life, rainfall, oxygen, all things differently. And again, it's not about um, the danger is having these installations and persons not understanding how to configure them. So this is why instead is with open and transparency of having the information together and we understand how can we trans, uh, configure it differently? Where do we put it? If it's a sensitive zone, non-sensitive zone, uh, high density, low density, how do we configure differently or which technologies? Because that will make significant differences in the impacts. And this is what we test uh, on MRI brain scans and EEGs um, on not only Thank animals, but on humans. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Lake. Chairperson, I'm, I'm satisfied with the answer for now. But I'd just like to see whether you agree with my original proposal. Thank you. Yes, yes, then that's the issue. Yeah. I, I, I buy that, 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 that proposal. That's how we're going to close on this matter. 
and I believe the secretary has noted your proposal is supported. Then, yeah, then Honorable Bryant, I also covered so that we proceed. Uh, no, Chair, I'm not covered. Unfortunately, uh, uh, I, I was just asking you in terms of um, the other questions to Mr. Lek, in terms of his role as a government official and who's funding uh, the, the the research, which government department, and also his training. Thanks. Can you respond to the question of Honourable Dave, Mr. Lek? Yes. So as a diplomatic science officer, I do not report to just one uh, government entity or department. This is where it's recorded a lot around the world that there is sometimes uh, bureaucratic uh, headbutting. Uh, but my original funding is uh, through the National Research Foundation of South Africa, the Department of Science and Innovation. Um, however, I, uh, my appointment of this was National Research Foundation. Uh, Durka also had to go through the whole processes um, of vetting and checking, and the Minister of Health at our Geneva mission uh, then processed through for my uh, representation for South Africa uh, per this role. Uh, in terms of the training, I have a very, very wide background. So I've got geography, computer science, information systems. Uh, I used to run uh, wind turbine and renewable energy manufacturing plants, uh, business administration, um, animal welfare uh studying some law a very wide variety of things and given the nature of the um wiring my brain being differently uh this is why i i don't make up anything new i just take what's already proven the different disciplines and bring them together as a package solution and try to bridge that gap between complex science and take it over the political barrier um so bringing both parts of all game what's asked for the team is my one of the things I always ask for is, is for persons to try these different uh, advancements that have been done by scientists. And one very great uh, product, uh, I don't know if you're aware of, we use in our government facilities, is called ProVac, where we actually, um, one uses bacteria as a very effective cleaning solution, outperforms many other chemicals. And this you can find in pick and pay, checkers and everywhere else. And what's great about it is that it can be ramped up very quickly and it's very highly concentratable meaning that you're reducing the load on trucks, driving, roads, but just to buy the product uh, in, in, in the supermarket, ProBac, and just to try and experience it, feel how it's soft, feel how there's no smell, feel how it makes a difference to, to your household performance. And by first experiencing these different solution advancements, one is able then to understand these complex sciences. And it's, it's, this is a thing where uh, I try to do a lot of picture references because it's not, it's, we always try to think of taking something uh, simplicity within complexity um, is that any any person on the ground, even you, your children, and even with our, our SARS R&D programs can make a difference to make these dramatic impacts in South Africa. And this is the, I, the, the request is that any member in this committee, as I did with your secretary on Friday, uh, covering these different stories, she goes, oh, I'm going to go try that, or I'm going to do this, because one can quickly feel that difference even where we have like an algae column in, in buildings and you've got the equivalent in eight liters of 40 to 50 house plants. So if you're in a room that's very stuffy or smells bad or, or poor performance, like we have in some of our courthouses, just by using nature and plants removes the risk of COVID, removes the risk of, of stale air, horrible issues. Um, so in terms of training, I'm just a person that's multiple things that looks to be a problem solver and working together and inspiring uh, team members. And that's what I ask of you, to, of your committee members. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think we align ourselves with what Honorable Singh's uh, recommendation would like to thank you. And then as a way of advice, maybe one will then advise you to also approach those various departments uh, to market this innovation. I think that's the other issue, but also to say then, maybe I should allow the colleagues from the department as well, thanking you about the, your competency with regard to this EMF radiation exposure, Ms. Bandeman. Vanessa, want to comment something as we're thanking Mr. Lake for taking time to present, and then you've had our way forward on the matter. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, from my side, um, 
we've taken note of the presentation and uh, we have nothing further. I will ask the other management team online if there's anything further that they would like to clarify. Uh, we do have Peter Lukey online as well. Uh, uh, Peter, I'm not sure if you want to come in and comment. Thank you. Chair, from my side, um, there, I, I have nothing to add. I'll just I'd be very interested to see the uh, the paper that was referred to and uh, to look through that because um, I can't seem to find it online. Um, but I'd very, very much like to see that paper. Thank you, Chair. It's on. That's on. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lech. Then we'll then inform you of the outcomes of our engagement. Also, same time, we'll be reverting, reverting back to the house chair who referred this report to us on our decision. You are more than welcome, and then you exude. Thank you so much. CEO, Chairman of Ismangali, so are you ready? Yes, we are ready, Honorable Chairperson. We can proceed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Chairperson, Honorable Mutambi, for the opportunity given to Ismangali's authority to present its third and fourth quarterly performance of the report. Um, express. My greetings to uh, Honorable uh, Deputy Minister, who I understand is in attendance, uh, Acting DG, uh, officials of the department, Honorable members of the Portfolio Committee, uh, CEOs of, uh, co uh, and colleagues from a uh, sister, ent uh, sister entity that is with us at this meeting. Uh, with me is the CEO of Isimanga Liso, Mr. Bukosini, and the CFO, Ms. Kamgile Mdambo. Honorable Chairperson, I'm very pleased to report that in spite of the three catastrophes experienced in KZN, those being COVID-19, looting and floods, this Mangalisa has been able to achieve a 92% on performance on target, 4% work in progress, and 4% of target as the CEO will elaborate and uh, later in his presentation. However, uh, Honorable Chairperson, I do want to mention that uh, stray strides were taken to reduce the percentage of the off-target performance uh, during the time when this report was compiled. I also think, uh, Chairperson, it is important uh, that I indicate to this committee that the entity has received the audit outcome and Honorable Chairperson, I am pleased to report the, uh, to this committee that the entity received an unqualified audit opinion. Isma Alisa report uh, that will be presented, uh, of course, is based on its four programs, those being corporate support services, biodiversity conservation, tourism and business development, as well as socioeconomic environmental development. I also would like to mention that Ismangaliso has worked very hard to ensure that it executes its, its mandate. And uh, at this point, it has really made every effort to ensure uh, that uh, the world heritage status is maintained and also that the, the, the ensuring that the ecological integrity of, of the ecosystems within the world heritage site are maintained. I think it is also important for me to mention that uh, East Mangaliso is also working very hard to follow through the implementation plan of the recommendations of the ministerial panel of experts on breaching of, his, of the mouth of East Mangaliso, uh, of, of the St. Lucia estuary, which fortunately is still open thanks to the intervention of Mother, of Mother Nature. Uh, the action plan has indeed been developed. And as we speak, uh, there is a lot of progress on that. But then again, uh, when you look at the whole plan, we realize that a lot of financial resources will be presented, 
But again, I will request that the CEO elaborate on this when he does his presentation. But what is important to mention at this point is that we're really making sure that that, that action plan is being implemented. And also linked to that, the board established the task team by extending the terms of reference of the social and ethics committee of the board uh, to engage closely with the local communities in order to ensure that the relationship between Ismangaliso and its uh, uh, stakeholders is strengthened. Uh, this also came with the recommendations uh, from uh, the ministerial pa uh, panel of experts. I think, Honorable Chairperson, this is also important that I mention that uh, there is also a, a progress on the implementation of the commercialization uh, strategy. Uh, this committee will remember that we, we reported that uh, the commercialization strategy was launched uh, last year in August. And at the moment, we have really made significant progress on that. Uh, the CEO will again give details when he does his presentation on that. Uh, members of this committee, it is important that I indicate to this committee that the entity continues to enhance its commitment to work with the stakeholders. And these include people in parks, uh, fisheries, farm, uh, farmers, both commercial and subsistence farmers, SMEs, and ordinary members of the community. Also of significance is that uh, the entity is very aware that it should not always be reliant on the government grants. Therefore, uh, the financial position of the entity is very important to the board. Uh, financial sustainability remains a standing item on the agenda of the board. Currently, the entity is in a healthy financial position compared to the same period during the previous year. And this is giving us hope that we are really moving forward with our attempts of ensuring that the entity is financially sustainable. I think at this point, Chairperson, I will request, uh, I will request that uh, I be allowed to hand over to the CEO, Mr. Bukosini, to do the presentation. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chairperson. Over to you, CEO. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, a very good morning to you, uh, honorable members. Our, our DM present with us here, the acting DG, and um, colleagues from the department who are present, as well as uh, colleagues from, um, from our entity as well. Um, Prof, you have forgotten to also mention that we have Lumi, our strategy support manager, who is in our midst here. Um, yes. Thank you. Yes, no, thank you very much, Prof. I think you, you have done quite a lot, but let me once again reiterate the fact that we, we measure our performance using the three uh, uh, grids or the criteria, the analysis criteria, where all the targets that are um, um, achieved is 100% and those that are in progress is 50 to 99% and those that are off target is zero Prof. Zama? To Prof. Zama? Professor, can you just mute your microphone so that we don't disrupt the CEO, please? Um, thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Um, our performance for the third quarter in, in, in particular, um, I'm not too sure, Chairperson, if you would want me to just concentrate on the yellow and the red um, and just talk to briefly. But generally, Prof, I mean, uh, Chairperson, it's 92%. You know it very well. That's where you must focus on. Thank you very much. So our performance is sitting at 92%, and that can be attributed to uh, hard work that we've seen in the entity and um, the areas where we still have yellow or where we had yellow in the in the in the in the third quarter it was the workplace skills plan um, that we were 
still in the process of making a preparation for submission to the board for approval. Uh, if we can go to that slide. Uh, and that was going to be done in February in 2022, which I must report, uh, Chairperson, that it was accordingly uh, attended to. In terms of the areas where we had read, um, it was an issue between, it's a, there's a meeting or there are quarterly meetings that we hold with SMV located in wildlife in accordance with the institutional arrangement which we have with them. Um, where we discuss uh, bilateral issues, especially on conservation-related matters. Now, that meeting could not happen in the third quarter because majority of the executives from the side of SM Value were unfortunately not available and could not be available during that time, uh, December, to attend that meeting. This despite numerous engagements that we tried to hold the meeting, but unfortunately it could not uh, take place. The second issue is the cubic meters of the of earthworks in wetland rehabilitation. Um, again, that that target could not be achieved, um, and this was mainly because of the delayed transfer again of the funding um, of uh, to to us for us to be able to execute or implement uh, this target. So, in as far as quarter three is concerned, um, Honorable Chairperson, that was the performance and those were the areas uh, which we were unfortunately short of, which then culminated to us achieving that 92% uh, overall um, as an organization. Uh, if I may, Chairperson, with your permission, just go straight to uh, program to, 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 to quarter four. Um, you will realize that uh, when we go to quarter four, we are reporting 100% uh, performance. Um, and um, I think I will leave it there because there are no yellow or red targets that I need to respond to. But I will then allow the CFO to take you through both the third as well as the fourth quarter financials. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. I will then attend to the issues of the, um, the, 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 the estuary um, as, 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 as there was a question or a request for me to attend to that, as well as the issue of the commercialization later on, but shortly after the CFO has finalized her presentation. Thank you, Chairperson. Okay, over to you, CEO. Good, uh, good morning, Chairperson. Uh, good morning, honorable members. Thank you. Uh, so much CEO for the opportunity and good morning Prof. Um, in terms of the financial performance uh, uh, CEO and Chairperson is that it, the during quarter three we saw some improvement in our finances from um, when you compare it with the previous year there was an improvement especially on quarter start we started to see improvement on quarter three throughout to quarter four so in in terms of revenue our park revenue we're able to increase from 11 million to 8.6 million. And the revenue generated by the NDT was about 19 million. When you compare with the previous time, it, it, last time, last year, it, it, it was not the same as this. Because of relaxation on COVID uh, regulation, we're able to achieve that 19.196. And uh, I was listening yesterday to the news that tourism is starting to pick up. We are sitting at about 51% overall. So in, even in our case, we, we can see the improvement. But in terms of the, 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 at the end of the quarter, quarter three, we're sitting at a deficit of about 10 million. Um, and then can we, can we move to the next slide? Uh, but it, all our, our expenditure were maintained throughout. As a result, if we can also move to the next, so it means on our park revenue, we increase about 7.1 million. And in terms of actual versus um, budget, we're still within our budget. There were no items where we exceeded. If we can move to the next slide to see our financial position, um, as, as the chairperson of the board had said, that we, our financial was, financials uh, were still, um, Good, because we are sitting at, at its 
a one is to one at this point, even though the acceptable one, it is in terms of liquidity, you, are sit, you need to sit at about two is to one where you are able to meet your own obligation. But in terms of quarter, quarter three, we our asset was sitting at about 792. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's the major one. The other thing that we had done, uh, 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 this is, was our first quarter where we registered for VAT. And at that time, we we're expecting to receive about 7.8 million, uh, 8 million from SARS for, for quarter three. Uh, and then we'd like to move to quarter four financials. If we can just assist me to go to quarter four financials uh, from, it's not on this presentation. So we need to go to the next presentation of Smangadi. So it's quarter four. Okay, this is quarter four of, of our financials. And as, I, as I've as i mentioned, if you look at the last quarter, we were sitting at about 11 million. And at the end of quarter four, we were sitting at 17 million pack revenue. These are amounts that we receive through gate, um, gate access. And you can see it has moved. If you compare, because this was now 12 months, if you compare 2021, we're sitting at about 12 million. And in 2022, we're sitting about 17 million. So there is a huge difference. And we expect the change even in this current financial year. So overall, the total revenue generated from by, by the park, it moved from 28 million to 33 million. And in terms of the grants, of, of course, in the current year, we did not have presidential stimulus, hence our grants were the one that we received from the department and were maintained, which equates to 272. And all, when you look at our expenditure, they were all maintained. The only difference that from the last quarter was that in this quarter, in, 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 in the end of the financial year, we had a surplus of about 20.8, um, 28 million, um, and, uh, uh, which also, goes to the attributes of 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 having of 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 also having the, the being registered for VAT. If we can go to the next slide, I will, I will also want to explain more. Uh, the next slide. This is this is the summary of what I explained. If we go, we can go to the next slide. This is the slide about the actual versus the budget. If we can also go to the next slide. The important one is on the next slide. As I've mentioned, that we are now registered with VAT. And um, if you can go to the next slide for financial position, here our asset increase from the last quarter to the to 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 to, to the last quarter, it was about 30, 30 million. And um, maybe if I can also explain, you have a receivable from non exchange, which was coming from the department. The, there was an implementation that we had or the grant that we received. For, for the fence, I think we also mentioned on our last portfolio uh, meeting is that we 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 had received an allocation letter with that amount of 27 million, and we at the end of the financial year we had already executed on the project, but the money hadn't come in our account. It came on the first of 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 April, but we had already executed. As I've also mentioned that we are registered for VAT. Um, some good news is that at at at, at at this point, we have received about nine plus 92 million that we received from SARS um, as, 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 as refunds. This is due to the previous year. We requested that we want to open the previous financial years so that we can be able to, uh, to, 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 able to claim from those amounts. Um, other than that, our liquidity was 0.84. Um, oh, was 0 0.84 is to one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairperson. If I may, with the SRE, with your permission. Okay. Can I also see you? Oh. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry, Chairperson. I, I don't know whether did was I cut. No. We thought you were no. done. You said thank you. There was a slide that said thank you. On your yes, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Okay, we heard you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Chairperson. At least uh, I don't have those problems with my picture mm. today. 
Well, we said we thought we are the same WhatsApp group. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Now, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, I think members will recall, um, which is, I think, the reason why they're asking what is the progress in as far mm -hmm. as the estuary uh, management plan or so estuary, um, the Lake St. Lucia estuary um, action plan is concerned. Uh, we we received that report as from the members of the panel, and we then developed. Uh, we subsequently developed an action plan. Uh, the focus on that action plan, uh, chairperson and members, was to make sure that we develop um, activities and tasks that need to be conducted by the entity, but also identify those that could be uh, uh, that are going to be implemented by other. Uh, government um, uh, um, um, organ structures, as well as the private sector, in this case, farmers, the community, and so on. So one of the key issues out of that um, action plan was the issue of the monitoring plan, which was developed as at uh, 2022 um, uh, in June uh, this year. So that plan is now there. Uh, but that plan has also been um, uh, developed to an extent of now looking into what needs to be done. So we, there is an implementation plan um, which needs to be to be to be executed, and that plan, if we do the budget estimates, requires about 21 million. And uh, currently, in our budget, we have one million. Um, which then uh, made us to engage with the department on trying to find uh, sources or funding to make sure that this plan kicks off. Those engagements are currently underway. Um, in my meeting with the DG, we were looking into also engaging the DGs from other departments, for instance, the Department of Water and Sanitation, Agriculture, Land Affairs, and so on, to see uh, how best they can also assist in terms of other activities that are contained in in the plan itself. There was also a target um, which was supposed to be implemented as of April 2022, which is that one of uh, clearing of the alien plants um, from the June because they were causing the problem of stabilizing the dunes, thus, thus making it very difficult for them all to bridge um, naturally. That is that that has been currently ongoing, uh, and of course there has been disturbances because of the inundation of water and uh, the influx of crocodiles as well as hippos. As if you do go to the estuary today, you will see that um, quite often we do find um, uh, your hippos, you find your crocodiles, and sometimes sharks, which makes it um, very difficult to work in that area. Uh, but um, progress is is currently underway in as far as the clearing of that uh, is concerned. In the main, the issue that we're looking at there is the cassering. Um The the other issue, uh, Chairperson, which I think is is more important, is that one of the the levees in the canals. Uh, um, one of the key issues there was to see how best we deal with the issue of removing. The sediment, because that in the main has been the problem in as far as uh, allowing water to be able to flow and flush some of the sediment. Um, that again has been an issue, but um, we unfortunately do not have that mandate, especially outside the park, and that will then require that the Department of Water and Sanitation works on that. And that is where this engagement between myself, DG, and the DDG uh, with the Department of Water and Sanitation um, is, is becoming parallel imperative. But also we're engaging with the farmers, um, uh, the Ratepayers Association, but in the main the farmers because of their um, role in as far as the canals are concerned because they are owning those canals and um, they also have a role to play in terms of assisting in, in dealing with certain aspects of the levees and canals, especially on, on, on their part. So, so far, um, uh, Chairperson, those are the areas where we had to concentrate on, and we are post continuously meeting with other government departments to discuss on issues that pertain to how do we 
really alleviate this uh, situation. We have um, accordingly met with uh, the stakeholders, the farmers, um, the ratepayers association, the committee from Sokulu, uh, the chairperson of the, 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 the small scale farmers, and we have discussed quite a number of issues, uh, including the issues that I have talked to. We have also agreed with uh, that uh, collective that we are going to have special task teams focusing on specific things. Uh, but I think we did explain to them some of the challenges that we have, i.e. the issue of the funding, which we are dealing with with the DG as we speak. Um, on the issue of uh, appointing the, 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 the estrogen uh, ecologist, we have made a provision as the CFO was talking about us having money that we have now received. We have made a provision that in the budget adjustment, we will allocate certain funding to appoint that ecologist for at least a, in a contract of, of at least five years. Uh, that um, also together with um, the research, uh, the researcher who will be able to provide us. That is just to make sure that we augment our capacity as well, instead of relying too much on the consultants. Uh, but in the meantime, whilst we are working on that, we have written to Sanbi to second, um, uh, to, to second the the ecologist to Ismail. So, and we are awaiting the response from Sanbi in, in, in that regard. So Chairperson, very briefly, in as far as the issue of the estuary, um, that is where we are. And the um, Chairperson of the board has um, correctly alluded to the fact that the, the estuary remains open as we speak. Um, we have seen, although it's not scientifically justified, but we have seen a little bit of impact in terms of the, 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 the vegetation uh, inside the estuary that is slowly uh, showing signs of uh, drying up. Um, but I think we are yet to, to look into that. The issues of the salinity and the water levels, those are being dealt uh, with by Ezenville Kensington Wildlife on a daily basis and it's ongoing. Uh, so that is what is currently happening. Uh, so we are constantly engaging with the stakeholders. After the meeting that I had with the farmers, the ratepayers association, as well as the Sokulu and, uh, but the committees, I also went and have a community meeting with the Dugudu community, especially that is um, largely affected by what is happening. And we explained to them uh, all this implementation plan, the challenges that we have, the plan that we have, and engagements that we are having. And I pledge to them that we will on regular basis keep on updating them on uh, how far we are going um, in terms of implementing this, this, this um, uh, action plan. So that is where we are in as far as the estuary um, is concerned. On the issue of the commercialization, uh, we did obtain the, the, the exemption from the National Treasury and um, the, the project team that I, I appointed has set uh, a report is, is, is on my desk for approval so that we can now start the process of advertising the small caps. Those are activities that are below 10 million. Those are your open uh, game vehicles, um, game drive vehicles, your boats, um, your, 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 your diving and many other activities that we have. Um, so that is going to be advertised as of uh, this oncoming September. For the large caps, um, DM, we have written to the minister to say that we have concluded all the processes with SML organized labor and uh, I think we are just en route to uh, start the process of now appointing the transactional advisors as well as um, conducting the feasibility studies, which will then see these facilities being put on the market uh, going forward. So that is how far we have gone in as far as commercialization is concerned. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson and members. We will take questions thereafter. Thank you for that update, CEO.
Okay. It's time for questions and discussions. Colleagues. Can I see a show of hands? It's Honorable Brian is going to be followed by Honorable Phillips, then Honorable Singh in that order. Honorable Brian, over to you. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you to the uh, officials for the presentation. Um, my first question is in terms of um, the target on biodiversity conservation. There's 12% uh, off target there. Um, what are the reasons for um, that 12% um, um, off target uh, status? And um, in which areas of biodiversity conservation um, are um, they currently off target? Um, and what uh, are, there, are, there, are the reasons behind this? Has it got anything to do with budget? Or, or what are the specific reasons in terms of missing that target? Um, the uh, presenter mentioned the meeting that was supposed to take place with Isambelo in December, on December the 21st, and that the representatives from Isambelo um, uh, stated that they were unable to attend. Um, can you please expand a little bit in terms of what the reasons were that were given uh, for those representatives not attending the meeting, um, even though, as he mentions, they were given prior notification uh, and originally agreed, apparently. What were the reasons um, given uh, for, for that non-attendance? And then in terms of the unspent conditional grants, I did note the point that uh, I think that it was mentioned that 20 mil um, has, has already been spent going towards uh, the fence. Um, but that would still leave around about 70 million of the 90 million unspent. Um, what uh, are the uh, projects uh, or the areas where that uh, funding is supposed to be spent um, uh, that uh, are currently not receiving that attention? Um, 70 million is still a considerable amount of money which could be spent um, within the park. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Phillips. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for that report. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. The first will be for our for the chair, Professor Tandi. Um, uh, Professor, which uh, you referred to an action plan which has been implemented. Can you just tell us which action plan that is? And then um, you also referred to a number of community interactions. Can you please give me how many uh, meetings have been held with the small scale and the commercial farmers um, since the high level panel report came out? Um, Mr. Uh, Bukusini, the CEO, um, the earthworks that you referred to, what are they intended to do? And then the invasive clearing of the Casuarina that the chair and I saw on the dunes. I know you've referred to that there's a challenge with um, hippo and crocodile. Um, your rangers actually work in a national park, so we would assume that they would be um, quite au fait with how to work safely in amongst these animals. The rangers in the Kruger National Park work, work amongst those animals with, in addition to um, other big cat predators, and they managed to do their job quite well. So I would like to know how many hectares of the Kasuringa have actually been um, cleared. I see there was no mention made in your report about the head office building that much fanfare was made about, much money was spent on, and which last time I went past there was just standing as an empty shell. Um, then you referred to the action plan of the high level panel, and you said you've got an action plan, but now you need to decide what needs to be done. Well, um, yeah, I'm a little bit confused about that because I would have thought that you first need to know what needs to be done before you come up with an action plan. 
Um, your amount given was 21 million, and um, I just would like that to be broken down into exactly what what of that 21 million you need to use where. Um, how and removing the sediment, uh, the approximate quote for that was about 6 million. And I know that the um, farmers or the sugarcane association had agreed to help with that, but nothing has been done to date. So we're sitting off at six months after an, a high level panel was appointed to address a really critical problem in St. Lucia and nothing has been done about it. There is physically no change. Um, in the high level panel report, we noted that there were a number of measurements that should be taken that aren't being taken. And I would very much like to know whether any silt levels of the inflowing silt, both into the estuary and into the lake are being uh, measured. And if they are, where are they being measured and what are those measurements? Um, and then I need to broach this, and I I'm, I'm, know it wasn't in your report, but we have this huge problem with Isambelo, um a bit further up in, in the game reserve, where we've had a large amount of rhino poached, where we've had fences down, damage to um, communities by the animals, fences probably um, allegedly damaged by the community themselves. But this seeing Isambelo seems to be a law unto themselves. And I'm just wondering how we can um, intervene in this disaster that is happening there. And if you've got any suggestions about how, as a portfolio committee, um, we could become involved in that and then and, and possibly help to solve these problems because if we don't do something about it soon, we're going to have no rhino left and probably no lion and the community are just going to carry on being affected and being very unhappy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Phillips. Honorable Singh, over to you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I think my two colleagues have... Uh, touched on the subjects that I wanted to broach, <clears throat> but just on a matter, <clears throat> matter of emphasis. Thank you for the presentation. The 27th January 2022 meeting with Zambello didn't take place. And I know that was in the fourth quarter, but since then, uh, did any meetings take place? Because there is a new board uh, that uh, we saw announced by the previous MEC. Secondly, there have been issues uh, uh, that Mr. Bukosini referred to that involve funding and other departments. Now, perhaps this question should be directed to the acting DG. To what extent is the department uh, DFFE uh, playing a role in ensuring that this funding is made available uh, with regard to uh, also the high level panels uh, execution of their plans? Uh, because he did say that the department was approached uh, my last question would relate to the uh, authority from Treasury on commercialization. Could we get a list of all those uh, projects uh, or entities or subdivisions that would be commercialized and when the tenders go out for them? Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Singh. I don't see any other hands. Maybe let me just also raise my issues. Chairperson uh, and CEO, including the fellow uh, management team members, I think you deserve to be commended for the job well done, uh, despite the, the mounting challenges that you face as a conservation agency. Uh, you know the issues is when you have your neighboring communities that are looking <laughs> to the park for survival. And then one then wants to encourage you 
that also include, I suppose, the committee as well, that you then zealously uh, pursue good neighborhood with the surrounding communities. Because without those, without their cooperation, uh, this beautiful Ismangaliso wetland park cannot be sustained in perpetuity, especially against the tide of uh, poverty in these communities. Then one would like to encourage you, Chairperson and CEO and the team, to enforce the law with compassion. You must never say these people, rather say our people, because indeed they are our people. Having said what I've said, notwithstanding, I would like to also ask yourselves about the total number of land claims launched against the park as it's June 2019. And then the issue here is as to how many of those claims were resolved to date and how many are outstanding. And whether the recent land invasions that we have seen around the park had anything to do with those outstanding land claims or how have those unresolved land claims influenced the park and the people relations within the Ismangali Sowet Land Park? So those are the issues that I want clarity on. Over to you, Chairperson and CEO and the other colleagues. Thanks, Honorable Chairperson. I think uh, I will start. Uh, the questions that I, I think were directed to my introductory remarks had to do with the, with the action plan. Stop, stop, stop. 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 Professor Zama? I'm sorry, Chair. <laughs> mm. I know you are Thank overwhelmed you. about what happened. Proceed. Sorry for that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I was saying that the questions that were directed to me were mainly based on the opening remarks that I made earlier uh, that had to do with the action plan. Uh, the action plan that I am referring to uh, is the one that uh, the CEO actually uh, mentioned uh, in his presentation, is the action plan that is based on the recommendation of the Ministerial Panel of Experts. Uh, when the report was, was presented and uh, all stakeholders were there, uh, the uh, implementation plan was then prepared by the entity and then was presented to everybody that was there. Then on the basis of uh, that imp implementation plan, there was then an action plan, which was an indication of what will be done when. It was then at that point that it was discovered that in order for the entity to really implement each and every recommendation that was uh, coming from uh, the ministerial panel of experts, that then there will be a need uh, for the entity to raise that amount of 21 million. So uh, members of the committee, the action plan that I was talking about is the very one that the CEO was speaking on, which is based on the recommendations that were made by uh, the members of, uh, of the ministerial panel. I think I also would like to uh, touch on on, on the meetings, I think that is also another question that was directed to me as to uh, how many meetings have been held with the communities. I think I did mention uh, when I was doing my opening remarks that a number of meetings have been held uh, with a number of stakeholders, uh, which include, of course, people in parks, which include uh, small scale farmers, which include uh, 
the SMMEs. I may not have the exact number of meetings that have been held, but I know for a fact that these meetings took place and when the CEO was, uh, was doing his own presentation, he even indicated that some of these meetings were actually led by himself, where he went to uh, local communities and held these meetings. And so, uh, honorable members of, the, of, of this committee, I think I would like to confirm that yes, uh, all stakeholders have been engaged in one way or another. Uh, in most cases, it will obviously be uh, uh, that group of people that are dealing with a specific matter at that particular point in time. But these meetings do happen and they have been reported time and time again uh, to the board. However, perhaps I think I should also indicate that the board has also um, established its own task team. And I indicated that actually it wasn't really a new task team, but we expanded the terms of reference of the social and ethics committee. So that is the committee of the board or the task team of the board that will also be engaging with local communities, which is also in line with uh, the recommendations of the ministerial uh, panel of experts. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, I think I have responded to the two questions that were directed specifically to me. And I will then request for the CEO to add and if necessary, I will also add something else. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. I will now request the CEO to add to what I've just said and respond to a number of questions that have been posed to us. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Um, Maybe, maybe let me just start, uh, Chairperson, on the, on the question on, on small-scale fisheries. Uh, Chairperson, you'll recall that at some point... Can, there was... can we see you, CEO, please? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the video people in Parliament are fighting with me. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I'm saying that uh, in, in, in regards to the issue of the small-scale fisheries, you will recall, Chairperson, that there was a, a very huge concern from members of the community, and so especially the small-scale fisheries, that they are being harassed and there are so many concerns that they have with regards to their operations. So I have taken it upon myself to just hold meetings with them wherein I get to understand exactly what their issues are. And they have frankly, um, they frankly uh, um, uh, shared with me their frustrations. And I'm happy to say that I then made a commitment with them that I am going to elevate their, their matters to a point where I hold personally and I, will, I am chairing quarterly meetings with them. To date, uh, we've had uh, two meetings already. Uh, and I must report to you, Chairperson, that the relationship between ourselves and the small-scale fisheries have really turned 360 degrees purely because of that. The issues that they are raising, some of them are very, are very petty issues, which really did not require us to be in a position where we found ourselves in, i.e. the issue of them being able to access the park uh, or creating the cards uh, so that they'll be able to produce those cuts when they get into the park for fishing purposes. So what is interesting now is that we are really coming up with very good solutions on how best we can work with them collaboratively in a manner that is going to ensure that their practices are not compromised and they are not um, uh, disturbed uh, unnecessarily. So we I can assure you that we are working with them uh, on those issues, and there are no challenges uh, going forward. Um, Honorable Phillips, the, the issue of the earthworks, as you know, Ismangaliso is a, is a Ismangaliso wetland park, and it is a largely a Ramsar site, which basically means that we our, our lifeline and our survival in the main is on the basis of us being a wetland. Uh, <clears throat> so what we do, because um, if you look at the history of Ismangali, so especially if you start from your Ismanga, from St. Lucia, your east as well as west, western shores, 
you will recall that originally this area was managed by forestry um, and a lot of um, uh, land management was done there which caused a lot of hips or dunes or unnatural dunes in the area. Now those dunes unfortunately affect the, the landscape which then affect the, the flow of water, especially between these wetlands. Now, in order for us to allow is the eastern shores and western shores in particular to operate as it used to operate many, many, many years ago, we then have this program to respond to that where we remove those dunes uh, so that we allow water to flow. If you were to go to St. Lucia Eastern Shores in particular, as well as Western Shores today, you will now appreciate the amount of water that is um, in that area because of wetlands that have been resuscitated. This also um, can be attributed to the management intervention uh, of the previous administration wherein they removed a lot of um, eucalyptus and um, <clears throat> pine trees, um, which then made it very uh, possible for those wetlands to be rehabilitated. And as we, as I talk to you now, those wetlands are, are functioning very well and they are there. And St. Lucia is very wet as we speak. On the issue of the crocodiles and hippos, um, where the, we need to be doing some work, it is true that we've got field rangers from the side of Ezembelu, but um, we are also on the side of the contractors now who are working, who are not necessarily the responsibility of Ezembelu, but Isma Aliso. We are now having a program which is coupled with the NRMM, NRM, which is working for water, wherein we now have people who will be assisting them in terms of um, uh, uh, providing that security services. But fact of the matter is that the conditions, as you know, if you go to St. Lucia now, um, they're not very safe and you don't want to expose people uh, to that because this is human lives and um, you just want to be very cautious. Yes, you can manage issues like your, 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 your hippos outside, and 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 you can manage issues like your 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 lions and so on, but it becomes very difficult to manage uh, your crocodiles as when when you are working and you are a contractor, uh, you're not a field ranger per se. So those are the challenges uh, from a precautionary point of view that we said, when there are those imminent risks, we need to be careful and not expose ourselves unnecessarily, lest we be found or receive litigations and uh, have problems um, with the public on that aspect. But as I say, uh, we are working around the clock to, to address that and work, as I say, in areas where there is no huge inundation, there is work that is being done there. Uh, in terms of the heritage, um, I think we are going to give you that. It's just that I don't have it with me now. Uh, if Lungi, you can just note that so that we can provide that in writing to say how many hectares have been removed uh, to date uh, in as far as, as, as those um, an invasive uh, plants on the, on the dunes. The head office building, um, thank you for, for reminding me to address that question. Um, that office, uh, which was, um, as you indicated, that you went there and you saw an empty building. If you were to go there today, you'll see a completely different story because there is construction that is going ahead. And we, in terms of our target, anticipate that in the next three to four months, um, that building we will be having a roof on top of it. Uh, the windows are there because the material is there. So the contractor is on site as we speak and they are finalizing whatever that is outstanding because um, the critical path in terms of the project was mainly on, on, on the roof because the rest has now been uh, achieved. Uh, the action plan, what needs to be done is quite a number of issues that need to be done in as far as that action plan, the monitoring, especially uh, the one that I am saying will require about 29 million. We've got issues on the water quality, um, you, you, as, as you said. 
Um, we're looking at a number of issues there, your salinity, water levels, the nutrients, the pH, dissolved oxygen, the flow direction, flow speed, the tidal height recordings. Those are issues that you want to be looking at and see how best you deal with. From a sediment dynamics point of view is your topographic surveys for the Lake St. Lucia as well as Mpulu's and Sunduzi system, uh, the leader, the LIDR. So those are issues that you will also want to look into, the nature and the source of those sediments, because again, that's another uh, research that you need to look at, the bathymetric surveys using the site scan, the soil sonar, depth of the profiles, total suspended ceiling, I mean, uh, solids, the sandbar, extent, um, crest height and water tepidity. Uh, that is now we look at in between the years. The use of the surveyor also as a special service to monitor the specific points along that sandbar. Um, from a hydrological point of view, you're looking at the fresh water inflow into the estuary. Uh, and obviously, as we said earlier on, that takes into account um, the influence on the salinity as well. But also, it also tells you whether the flow, the speed, as we said, I'm sure you'll recall, Honorable uh, Phillips, in my initial presentation, I was talking about the different velocities between Umsunduzi and Imfolozi, where Imfolozi is a high flow, uh, a re high flowing river, but Umsunduzi is, is, a, is a very slow, which then that combined causes the bed flooding when the mouth is not opened um, <clears throat> accordingly. So those are the issues that we wanted to look at. The water levels, as you have talked to, the daily condition of the mouth, and many other activities, uh, scientific um, uh, um, um, activities that need to be, to, to be done there. But in as far as the issue of uh, water levels, the salinity, and so on, fortunately, we do have um, as in the located in wildlife doing that on a daily basis, and we do have records and data uh, in as far as that is concerned. The, the issue of the farmers uh, committing six million to on the removal of the sediment, I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's going to be a matter that will be discussed in the in the next meeting which we'll be having very soon with the farmers because um, that will be their contribution. and I'm happy to hear that and I hope, um, they will confirm that commitment uh, so that we can start seeing a movement on their part um, uh, in as far as the issue of the canals in particular. Um, I, I think it, it's going to help us a lot in addressing what we are dealing with there. The issue of the rhino poaching, um, uh, uh, honorable members, you will recall that um, we did say to you that because of the good working relationship that we have now with the communities, if you talk about Isma Aliso in particular, the interventions that we have put in place, i.e. the dehorning of the rhinos, as well as strengthening the relations with communities living adjacent to this part, have really paid um, dividends in the sense that we don't have um, the same problems as we have in other areas where there is a sketch in terms of the rhino poaching. Um, so we really don't have too much of that problem. Um, instead, on our end, um, you know, the reserve manager in Pukula and Poluzi was just sharing with me, I think we're getting calves uh, as we speak. And um, we've got photographs, very exciting pictures to show that they are at ease and they are really breeding um, those rhinos in Mkuza in particular. We, you will recall that we removed ours from um, uh, Western Shores and the reason or the rationale for us removing them in, 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 in the Western Shores was purely because there is that arrangement with Siakubega where they were roaming into, the, into forestry and that's where they were really getting exposed. Uh, but also we had serious problems with visibility and availability of field rangers from Ezenvelo uh, due to challenges that they have at the present moment or that they had. The, the fences that are damaged, um, we are working very closely with, with Ezenvelo, um, Honorable Phillips, but yes, of course, their main challenge is that um, 
you know, they do not themselves have enough field rangers. Um, I did um, explain to you how many field rangers you need for how many hectares of a reserve. And if you look at that, there is serious uh, shortfall in terms of um, the, the, the number of the field rangers. So, but what I have done, um, the, I've gone to, to, to some of these communities to understand exactly what is the issue here. The issue here, and I'll be very blunt and be very honest with you, is purely poverty. Um, they, they, when we have these opportunities, unfortunately, we will not have opportunities for the entire community. We will have opportunities for two, three, four, or ten. Uh, those that did not get the opportunities, unfortunately, will then revolt and, um, uh, you know, complain that the why these, why not them. Um, but when you really go deeper, it's just um, hunger. Uh, but I must say that the support that we're getting from the department, especially when we are maintaining these fences, especially those that are along the coast, because they 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 rust quite. Um, rapidly, um, we do provide opportunities, and I did present to you the statistics in terms of SMMEs as well as job opportunities that are created as a result of that. So it's an issue that we're dealing with, but we are slowly and uh, gradually enjoying the intervention of the traditional leadership in addressing those issues. I have recently met with SAPS in particular to say they must also effect arrest and so that people will know that uh, in as much as we are having a carrot approach, but we also do have the capability of a stick approach. Uh, that is why if you look at Futululu, for instance, uh, you have people who are arrested, you have uh, the high court order uh, and so on. Um, and uh, the traditional leadership is very quick not to protect those who are breaking the law but saying that if people have concerns and understanding the issues of poverty, um, that we must work together in finding a solution. And of course, Ismail Aliso is not going to solve all the poverty unemployment issues in Umkanyagute, but Ismail Aliso can contribute uh, as we are currently doing and everyone can see that. The, the, the issue of the, um, um, how the portfolio committee could intervene. I think I think it's a subject uh, that we will have to look into. You know, if you look at the legislative framework in terms of the Restitution of Land Rights Act, um, it it sort of creates an expectation that once you own the land, you will then become an equal footing co-manager with the conservation agencies. Number two, it creates an expectation that you have full understanding in terms of the operations um, of what is happening inside the park. Um, now, if you go to NAMPA, if you go to other pieces of legislation, you then realize that the legislative framework does not create a situation which will meet those expectations. And this is my example, Chairperson. If you go to the cabinet memorandum of the people and parks, which is discussed usually at national level with the people and park structure, there is an expected there's a memorandum when there's an expectation from the claimants to say 60-40%. If there are opportunities, 60% must go to the claimants or the landowners, and 40% must be distributed to the broader community. But the reality now is that in terms of the PFMA, and if you were even to go to the MFMA, if you're in the context of local government, you, and you will not find um, the policies or any legislative framework which favors this 60, 40% to be implemented. So it then becomes an expectation that is not met by us and then creates uh, this hostility between ourselves and people who have the expectations. So there is a very big debate discussion around an enabling legislative framework, which is now going to align. Otherwise, all the other issues that we talk about in terms of community beneficiation become a pipe dream, uh, which is not implemented legally because there are no uh, uh, in instruments to, to deal with that. 
On the issue of um, SM Velocase and White Life, um, why they did not meet with us, what was the reason, uh, and so on. When we engaged with them, uh, some executive managers um, were not there, um, and we were told that they are not there. And when we looked at the quorum, it could not be uh, reached. Um, we tried on several occasions to find out exactly what challenges they were having, but unfortunately, uh, we just could not have those meetings. We, I then subsequently, in the beginning of the year, had a special meeting with the CEO, uh, the acting CEO. We sat down and he committed that he's now going to try and make sure that we don't have uh, these situations. And I must report that after his intervention, um, the meetings, uh, which we are supposed to have on quarterly basis are now taking place, and we did catch up uh, Honorable Singh in the court for, in the fourth quarter, uh, and we are now uh, on par in as far as those meetings are concerned. Hence, the hundred percent um, achievement in the fourth quarter uh, to address all that we could not achieve in the third quarter. Um, on the issue of the list of activities, um, uh, I did mention them, but yes, we can share with you uh, those activities because, um, yes, we did announce on the 25th that we're going this route, and um, we are happy that now we are advertising. It will be in September, and the website of Ismail Aliso will be buzzing with those opportunities. On the 24th, um, I'm meeting a number of stakeholders, um, including the business fraternity, where I will also now be outlining these activities, these opportunities. I've also invited the, um, the finance sector like your Itala. I've invited small business to also come and explain to those who may require funding, what are the processes and procedures that they need to follow so that no one will say that there was an opportunity, but we were not uh, given an opportunity to have access to funding so that we can participate in this economy of the park. Um, so this then, once again, reconfirms our, our commitment to the three-pronged strategy of conservation, ecotourism, and stakeholders, where we all do conservation with and for the people. Chairperson, you asked us, you asked about the number of uh, land claims that have been launched. Um, I may have to check, but last time I checked, I think we had about um, 12 or, or 14. Um, the majority of them have been, have been concluded, um, although some have been partially concluded if you were to look at it from a legislative point of view, because they are concluded purely on the basis of Section 42D, which basically means that there is an agreement in terms of the negotiations between the parties concerned. Uh, in this case, it will be Ismail Aliso and the land claimants and others. Um, but I, I, I must say that um, from those that have been settled, I think there are about six that have been settled. That will be uh, your Makasa, your Bangazi, your 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 Mkuse, uh, Gwanyalen claims. Uh, the Mbila one is the one that is sitting at the section 42D. But if you look at it, um, it's considered as a claim that has been settled. Now, what has happened is that we have entered into co-management agreements and there are funds that we pay as per the commitment of those co-management agreements that are derived. And those funds are derived from revenue that accrues or that we get from the gates and the concessions um, from the park. So that is how far uh, we are. The issue of the invasion, um, I must be honest to say it has absolutely nothing to do with the issue of the land claims. Um, when we looked at it quite carefully, um, especially in Futululu, it is um, in the main as a result of the local politics. Um, it is as a result of um, other people who are taking advantage of other members of the communities. For instance, if you go to Futululu, you will find people who are claiming 
that they are selling sites and people have paid money for those sites for both agricultural and residential purposes, only to find out that it's, it's just a scam because that land belongs to government and it's for conservation purposes. And for Tulolo, because of its conservation status, is one remaining um, a forest uh, which we really need to conserve because if you look throughout the park and throughout the province, uh, it is very special from a conservation point of view. Um, and we can at some point discuss that in detail. Um, yeah, so I think uh, Chairperson, in as far as land claims are concerned and the relationships, uh, that's how far we go. Um, and then, as I said, a lot still needs to be done in terms of the legislative uh, framework. Um, uh, um, Honorable Singh will, will agree with me, for instance, here that in, in, in most parts of Bugazulu Natal, where there are successful or finalized or semi finalized land claims, the hiccup is with the Ingonyama Trust because Ingonyama Trust does not agree with the current model of settling land claims. Um, now you then find the Restitution of Land Rights Act, NEMPA, and Ingonyama Trust Act not aligning around those issues. So, hence my submission to say from a portfolio point of view, that is the intervention that would require because that does cause a lot of tensions on the ground. And unfortunately, we don't have powers to attend to those issues as officials. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Can you then formally to write, write to us in that respect, CEO, where uh, you I need the alignment, the legislation alignment? Ne? I will if you can do that to us and then explain to us the challenges that you are encountering and propose to us, then we can take it from there. Thank you, Chairperson. I will do so. Any follow-ups? None. I don't see any end. Okay. Sorry, Chair, then... my hand is up. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chair. Um, thank you so much for that, um, CEO. I really do appreciate your, your replies. Um, on the staff shortage or um, shortfall in field ranges that you mentioned, um, is that a budgetary problem or is that simply an administration problem? Um, if you can maybe give us some more information about how we can go about rectifying that, because we cannot look after our rhinos and our other game if we don't have the right amount of field ranges. Thank you so much. Okay. See you. Uh, all right. Um, <clears throat> from the engagement that I had with um, the acting CEO as well, it's mainly a budgetary situation. Remember, when I was presenting to you the issue of the regulations where Ezenvelo is performing that conservation service to the authority, they indicated that they're having challenges that when a field ranger resigns or when a field, rangers, a field ranger passes on, um, Unfortunately, they are unable to fill that vacancy because of the budget cuts. He was just telling me that recently, I think in this current financial year, they had a 300 million budget cut. Um, some of the problems that they currently have in their own protected areas, i.e. in Polozi, with lions and hyenas and leopards uh, going out of the reserve, they just don't have money to mend that fence or to repair that fence. Now. It's purely financial. Uh, in my view, I think uh, we would need, because we get affected by this situation, we would need maybe if the portfolio committee can intervene at a national level to, en to engage with the provincial uh, department of ETIA to see how best they can assist in this situation. Because it doesn't only affect us in Bello, but it also affects us as well. Um, on our end. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Okay. Thank you so much, CEO, for the comprehensive responses, Chairperson, and the team. 
you are free to go unless if you want to listen to your other colleagues, but we want to appreciate you. Oh, honorable things ends up. Uh, yes, yes, Jefferson, thank you very much. Not a question, but I think as a portfolio committee, perhaps we must try and seek an arrangement and an engagement with our counterparts in KZN. Uh, just to find out what's happening at Zambello Wildlife, and then Honorable Phillips did mention some community issues. Uh, some of those issues were reported to me, and I had to get hold of the MEC at that time through legislature portfolio committee members of lions invading you know and killing cattle etc the matter has now been referred to the human rights commission who are investigating and i have all those reports but i think you know because we are involved nationally on the environmental issues we we need to have some kind of a briefing from them uh, working with our provincial counterparts thank you yeah i deliberately posted the a clip this happened last week where in community members were then uh, they they put the the park in Folozi, the floor in Folozi park to burn the gun house yeah you saw the stuff that i i put and then mostly na naturally you know the issues that we've been hearing around SML. i think it's high time we need to convene the new mec and maybe understand what is happening now the board last time it was a portion to the board there's a new board that has been appointed but there's a lot of things that happens around you hear a lot of stories around the isambelo issues then because it's also then what is an implementing agent or whatever with ismangalis then whatever they do also affect the work of ismangalis like that a uh, Target that you ask of the meeting with SM Velo, them not coming because they said that forum way in, then they can iron out matters of it. I think that can be done, that can be arranged that we have a meeting with, so that we iron out all those issues because whatever they do, Isamangalisa gets affected by official that they are stuff that they do. Remember the killings? Yes, it happened in the Isamangalisa Park by them. So, I think that's a matter that we need to follow up. But we want to thank you. Like I've said, we can excuse you, but if you want to stay, you can still stay. Having said that, then thank you so much, uh, Chairperson, CEO, and team. Then thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, members. Okay. Thank you. You need comfort break, five minutes as a. Um, they are loading their presentation. What does the vice chairperson be ready? Five minutes comfort break. Let's reconvene. I think we're doing ni nice on time according to the time schedules. Five minutes, it means we should be back at uh, three minutes past. Recording stopped.
of the Portfolio Committee, Honorable Deputy Minister, AT Acting Director General, representatives from the department, Mr. Peter Lukia, who is also a board member, and colleagues. It is a pleasure to introduce quarter three and quarter four performance results of South African Weather Services. The entity performed admirably in the last half of 2021-2022 financial year, and the achievements in each of the quarters will be presented by the Chief Executive Officer before this committee. Before introducing the achievements of the entity, I would like to introduce the Deputy Chairperson of South African Weather Services, Mr. Idani Paduli, Management of South African Weather Services, led by the CEO, Mr. Isham Abada, supported by Mr. Nomen Mzizi, the Chief Financial Officer, Dr. Jonas Mpepia, Executive Weather and Service, uh, Climate Services, Mr. Nikelinda Bambi, Executive Infrastructure and Information Systems, Ms. Zolega Makongolo, who is the acting, who was the acting uh, Executive Corporate Services during the periods under review, Ms. Petro Decker, the Executive Corporate Services, who joined South African Weather Services on the 1st of August 2022, Mr. Dituso Mohabi, Specialist Strategy, Planning and Reporting. Chairperson, the entity managed to achieve 80% and 88.89% of its targets in the third and fourth quarters, respectively. Through the implementation of its program one of the annual performance plan, which is weather and climate services, South African weather services ensured timely dissemination of weather information to various stakeholders and users for decision making. Early warnings and impact based forecasting initiative continued to be implemented and improved so that contribution is made to the safeguarding of lives and property. The entity continued with its commitment to provide aviation products and services that enable efficient, safe and regular flight operation in the Republic of South Africa and the region under the Convention on International Civil Aviation. Timely marine, uh, marine related products and services inclusive of coastal and deep sea products for those operating on the shores and those navigating uh, South Africa's surrounding oceans continued to be made available to the marine industry. As a scientific and research driven institution, South African Weather Services continued with the generation of scientific insight and innovation, advancement of meteorological sciences, as well as in products and services developed by the entity. The expansion of knowledge and intelligence related to atmospheric and related sciences remains the entity's goal despite the missed target to generate a certain number of research outputs in the third quarter. This missed target, however, did not hamper the achievement of the annual target under program two. Optimal infrastructure and information systems are fundamental to South African weather services value chain and ability to achieve its mandate. Under program three, Two targets pertaining to availability of global atmospheric watch, as well as priority areas quality station were missed in both uh, uh, quarter three and quarter four, respectively. Management, however, continues to identify and apply corrective measures to remedy the infrastructure challenges. The challenges of vandalism and electrical power related issues are plugging the priority areas, air quality stations, and trusted to South African weather services. The recapitalization of this network of station is ongoing and engagements with shareholder in this regard continues. 
The CEO will expand on this as he presents. Under program four, which is administration, including corporate and regulatory services, the entity continues to work on programs that create an environment that is conducive for high performance, career development, attraction, and retention of critical and scarce skills. Given the constraints of the fiscus, generation of revenue from multiple sources remains key for the survival of South African weather services. To this end, management developed a revenue turnaround plan as part of the entity's commercial strategy that is aimed at increasing revenue and tapping into other markets. It is envisaged that successful implementation of this plan will help with increasing South African weather services revenue in order to supplement a government grant allocation. In ensuring that there is inclusivity, diversity and representativity in South African weather services management roles, deliberate and active recruitment of women for management positions continues in the third and fourth quarter. South African Weather Services aims to have a balanced representat representation of gender in the entity and to align more closely with the sector within which it operates. Chairperson and members of the Portfolio Committee, please allow me to request the Chief Executive Officer to present quarter three and quarter four performance results of South African Weather Services. I thank you. With your permission, Chair, um, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, good afternoon, um, Honorable Chair, Honorable Board Members, uh, Deputy Minister, um, Chair of the Board, Acting DG and colleagues. Um, I'm going to go through the um, third quarter report. Um, Chair, and with your permission, I'll go through only the yellow and the um, reds in the respective reports. Um, and I'll do the third quarter report quite quickly um, because some of the issues are recurring and they'll, um, I'll explain them a little more fully in the fourth quarter uh, um, report when I discuss um, those particular issues. Can we move to slide two, please? Um, as the chair indicated um, under slide two, um, this is the third quarter summary report where we achieved 80%, uh, partially achieved 20%, and there was no um, red items or items not achieved. Um, can we then move to slide number five? Under this item, um, we achieved 97% uh, of the percentage of availability of the national weather. Um, and there, um, the reason for that was we had extreme um, weather experience during the quarter. And um, there was obviously an increased time um, that was required for product generation and dissemination that we couldn't meet um, with, but we've subsequently put in corrective measures and we've discussed the matter with our shift, su shift supervisors um, so um, that we move our product deadlines um, a little bit more forward. Then um, I'd like to go to slide nine. Um, the chair man, uh, mentioned also um, during her opening that we had not met the target for the third quarter in terms of the number of research outputs. Um, and the challenges there were that um, there was slow processing of publications into journals. Um, and obviously the corrective measure would be to ensure that we then publish those. Um, if we go to slide 14, which is the next one that hasn't been achieved, um, this was, excuse me, Chair, a partial achievement of 80% of the Global Atmospheric Watch uh, infrastructure um, outputs. The target there is 85%. And in terms of our challenges, um, we had a problem with ozone soundings um, we, we, where our stock was depleted. Um, and then we also had a problem with one of our instruments, the um, Dobson 132 um, uh, apparently the optical wedge belt was not optimal um, 
our technical people will have to explain what that is. But just in terms of um, the, the delivery of the ozone stands, um, that happened in the following quarter uh, in terms of the correct, corrective measures. And also the, the instrument was repaired. And apparently it worked quite well um, and we achieved 100% um, reporting from that instrument um, during December. The next slide would be um, slide 17. Um, here, Chair, um, this relates to the percentage of priority areas air quality station availability on the South African Air Quality Information System. Um, and uh, th that supplies the, uh, or that meets, sorry, the minimum data requirements. Our target there is 75% in terms of the priority air, um, areas, air quality stations. We only achieved 51% there. Um, in terms of the challenges, and I said I will address them um, in, in the, the next quarterly report uh, in a bit more detail, but some of the challenges just to mention were theft and vandalism at Three Rivers Station and power villages um, and a damage transformer at uh, Cebu King, and then also it intermittent um, power surges that result in, 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 resulted in damage to instruments. Um, I'll talk to that a little bit in the fourth quarter um, report, Chair. Um, and then I think, Chair, those, uh, oh, so the next slide is slide 23. Um, and this one I'll talk to in a bit more detail when I do the fourth quarter uh, presentation because it's, it's exactly the same. Um, and then let me hand over, Chair, um, to the Chief Financial Officer on slide 27 to just discuss the um, third quarter um, financials um, um, with the committee. And then I'll present the um, remainder of the issues in quarter four. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Mzizi. Thank you, CEO. Honorable members, uh, honorable chair, thanks very much for this opportunity. In terms of uh, quarter three, we can see that uh, the total revenue were close to the budget of 370.9. And uh, the revenue from uh, exchange transaction from commercial revenue is uh, above uh, our budget. This is mainly to the improvement in the aviation industry. As we can see, the positive variance of 4.6. And uh, in total, uh, revenue from uh, non-exchange, we are slightly below the budget of uh, 298 by 5.5 million. And uh, this is coming mainly from the government grant, the conditional grant. And uh, in total for the quarter, we are sitting at uh, a surplus of uh, 39 million. And uh, the next slide, uh, Chair, indicates uh, the breakdown of uh, the revenue. And uh, as you can see that uh, we are, in total, we are slightly below the budget, but uh, if one compare it uh, to previous year of 2021, we are approaching that figure of uh, 421, because the full year budget for the year is 482, as we'll be seeing it in the next quarter four. Thanks, CEO. Thank you very much, um, CFO. Um, if we can then, yeah, thank you. Um, let's go to slide two on the quarter four report, please. Um, Chair and honorable members, you'll see this is the fourth quarter performance. You'll see that there was quite a jump in terms of the previous quarter. Um, our achievements jumped by about 9%. The partial achievements um, were 7.4, but then there was also a non-achievement, which is an annual target, which I'll talk to later in the presentation. Um, let's move on to slide three. The next slide, um, Chair, gives you the overall um, 
uh, percentage achievement, which is 82% um, uh, for the, the, the year. And then partially achieved was 14.29. And the one that was not achieved was 3.5% of our overall annual targets. Um, then I'd like to go to slide 14. Um, as we discussed in the quarter three performance, um, the percentage availability requirement for our global atmospheric watch um, sits at 85%. We only achieved um, 80%. Um, and uh, in terms of our overall annual progress, we had 81.5%, which means we missed it by about 3.5%. Um, some of the challenges that we had here um, were, as I mentioned, the ozone soundings, but in terms of that, the next quarter that was sorted out, so that's no longer an issue. I mentioned the 132 that was fixed. Um, we also had a nitrous oxide instrument, um, which um, suffered complete um, failure, um, but um, the, the, um, uh, these were some of the issues in relation to um, the core infrastructure availability. Um, and then I think the next slide um, I'll, I'd like to go to is um, the slide 16. Slide 16, please. So in terms of slide 16, um, here it was the percentage of priority areas air quality stations that are available on the um, SACWA system that meet minimum data requirements. Um, the target there is 75%. Um, um, we partially achieved there in that we, we, we got 69.4%. Um, and as I mentioned, we had challenges in terms of theft um, and vandalism. Um, and then I'd like to chair with your permission just um, talk to some of these issues because I know during the last meeting, um, the um, committee members raised um, the concerns around what specifically we were doing to address um, some of these issues. So just in terms of um, the, the priority area stations, um, in terms of that three river stations, um, we are going to relocate it and we're looking for a more secure site in terms of relocating that particular station. Um, similarly, with the uh, Cebu King station, uh, in the case of Cebu King Chair, we've identified a, uh, an alternative site. Um, and we've also finalized the um, landowner agreement with the owners of that site on the 16th of August. Um, so we, we're busy with appointment of contractors for site preparation. Um, and stuff like that to move several gangs specifically. <clears throat> then um, in terms of our obsolete instruments, we are um, looking at uh, um, replacing some of those um, <clears throat> and those uh, commissioning of the, of the new equipment is in place. In terms of upgrading um, security systems, we have upgraded some of our security systems. Um, and they have been completed at some of the stations. Others are planned for, um, in, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the next few quarters. Um, then also in terms of, of the issues around um, our uh, uninterrupted power supply systems, um, we are waiting um, delivery of that. And if you recall, Chair, um, there, were, there was mention also made in terms of the battery backup solutions um, which we are investigating um, to ensure that um, there's no um, interruption of um, the, the um, uh, information from those stations. Um, so, Chair, uh, the other issues that, um, were, that came up in the previous committee meeting um, was some of the UPSs. Um, currently, all our un uninterrupted power supplies are working except for Cape Town. Um, and we're hoping to have a new one for Cape Town by the end of September. Um, in terms of also our aging um, infrastructure, there is a process in place to acquire six new um, uh, uninterrupted power supplies and, and, and to replace those uh, older ones um, uh, quite shortly. 
Um, and those specifically would, would deal with our, our radars and, and issues around our radar sites. Um, there was also an issue in, in terms of the previous one around um, diesel. Um, and my executives indicated to me that we have sufficient diesel, um, but that they also um, are looking at the processes for procurement um, at a local level in some of the provinces to ensure that we don't have any issues in that regard. And in addition to that, they're also looking at the um, feasibility of purchasing our own diesel bowsers um, for some of our um, um, equipment so that we, we don't have any issues. And I think that in, in, in um, essence was how we um, de dealt with the corrective measures or the uh, in relation to the challenges that we had um, experienced. Then, um, Chair, I'd like you to go to the next slide, which is slide 19, um, which is our uh, only red, but it's a very worrying red because it's our triple BEE rating. Um, Chair, we did not achieve the um, required um, level uh, um, BEE rating of six. Um, and I'd like to once again, Chair, just um, elaborate a little bit, uh, if you allow me, on, on this, um, because th there's three pillars in essence that we um, had not met in terms of the, the, the BE. I think I did mention in the last meeting, Chair, that we had appointed a service provider to assist us, um, and that we've also developed a committee, um, and each of the committee members um, have specific pillars related to this that they deal with. Um, so in terms of us not meeting this target, the three areas where we didn't meet the target, and I'll start with the, the most prominent or the worst scoring, shall we say, um, was the enterprise and supplier development. Um, we only achieved 25.6 points out of a potential of 54 points. Um, and there we had to uh, look at improving um, supplier development contributions in terms of providing mentorship for suppliers um, uh, to, to enhance their operational effectiveness and also to grow these outside entities. Um, we also had to uh, identify um, black owned qualifying enterprises and assist with their development. Um, and as far as the enterprise development is concerned, um, we needed to, to groom um, and identify entities that can become part of our supply chain. Um, uh, so in, in this regard, Chair, I think we've done fairly well on the last point um, in terms of, of our local procurement, because I think um, the, we've exceeded the 65% targets and we're sitting in the 90s uh, odd percentage. The other bullet points under this um, particular pillar are a bit more difficult because a lot of our um, particularly our scientific equipment is purchased overseas. Um, and um, that, that in itself presents um, some challenges. Um, so there are no local suppliers that we, we can um, uplift. But in terms of our local procurement, as I said, there we are working on, on, on whatever we can in terms of um, <clears throat> um, uh, improving the situation. And then um, the second pillar was our skills development. Um, uh, I think, yeah, th this one's um, also, um, it has a potential target of, of 30 or point system of 30 where we've achieved uh, 9.8. Um, and it talks to our skills development expenditure on learning programs. Um, and I must uh, um, indicate here, Chair, that um, we, we've had financial constraints, both in terms of the uh, enterprise and supply development, as well as the skills development, in terms of insufficient budget being available to actually um, deal with some of these issues. Um, and as you well know, we've um, had to convert um, capital expenditure to operational, operational expenditure, um, just to meet our operational um, expenses. So. Um, these are some of the reasons why we've not um, achieved some of these uh, um, pillars. So there's a need for us to um, improve our, our skills development expenditure as the money um, becomes available, and specifically in relation to um, African people and African employees with disabilities. 
Um, and then um, also uh, we need to make sure that more um, African unemployed people are participating in training um, and that um, there's an absorption of um, people after their learnership programs. Um, in terms of the unemployed people, you'll note that some of our uh, um, training uh, initiatives are specifically for um, you know, skilled and particularly skilled people in meteorology. So um, that, that's also a bit of a difficulty. And then uh, absorbing some of the learners at the end of the period would obviously entail increasing our um, current structure um, or waiting for vacancies in terms of our current structure. But um, the one area where we've done fairly well, Chair, is that in terms of the number of African people that's been, that have participated in learnerships, um, uh, and we've, we've tried to be a bit more innovative in terms of how we do that, Chair. Um, and I'm advised that between April and July of this year, we appointed 18 people in learnership. So that, that um, has been quite a, a forward progression. Then um, in terms of management control, um, we, uh, we've achieved 16.09 points out of a potential of 20 points. Um, and we could have gotten an additional two points if we had African female executive directors um, that participate in the board. Um, uh, unfortunately, the only executive director um, position is the CEO's position, and um, I'm it for now, Chair, so it will remain um, until the, the, for the duration of my contract. But I just want to mention also that we've um, uh, areas under management control that we've uh, improved or over the last um, two quarters. In terms of senior management, we've appointed an African female between April and July um, and uh, of this year. Uh, in terms of our African female employees in senior management, uh, one's been appointed also during the period. In terms of middle management, we've had eight qualifying employees that were appointed, four males and four African females. Um, and then uh, in terms of middle management, I've many, I mentioned the four African females. Uh, in terms of junior management, there were six qualifying um, employees appointed, four African females and two African males. Um, and then in terms of junior, um, um, in terms of what the um, chairperson has mentioned in terms of our focus being on African female and the appointment um, of um, uh, this particular um, category of people, um, there's definitely an emphasis in terms of that chair. So I just wanted to mention to the um, committee that there's definitely a forward momentum in terms of that. And we're doing everything um, that we possibly can um, to improve that uh, one way because it doesn't look good on the rest of our report, which is mostly green and, and yellow. Um, Chair, the next slide is slide 20. Um, this was our revenue generation for the year. Our target was 28.6 million. We missed it by um, just over a million um, to 26.8 uh, million is what we actually achieved. Um, Chair, we, 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 we noted that the last two quarters, there was a general slump in terms of um, the, the, the general um, economic situation in the country. But more importantly for us, um, our partners lost um, a relevant revenue from some of their customers and clients that actually uh, impacted on our revenue generation. Um, and we're hoping that it's going to pick up, um, uh, especially with the increase in, 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 in aviation, uh, even though it's, 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 it's not part of the, the non-regulated, but we're hoping that our overall revenue generation is going to increase as well. Um, the next slide I'd like to talk to is slide 22 before I hand over to the CFO. Um, Chair, yeah, we had a target of five um, work integrated learning placements. And of those three had to be pe people living with disabilities. Um, we've partially achieved there in that we had four at the end of the period because one of our candidates actually um, fell pregnant and resigned um, and um, we did not meet that target. So those in essence were the um, amber and, and red targets that were partially met or not met at all. 
Um, and I'd like to hand over to the CFO again um, to carry on from slide 26 in relation to um, uh, the financial report as the end of March. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, Chair. Now, for quarter four, Chair, as you can see, the revenue we're sitting at the 476 million which is uh, about 5.5 million below the budget. I will discuss the details of uh, the revenue in the next slide. However, in this slide, what I would like to discuss is uh, when one compare the revenue for the current year versus uh, last year of 2020, 2020 and the 21 of uh, 400 and 21 million, this is above uh, that uh, revenue. And uh, in terms of uh, the expenditure, we're sitting at uh, 419, 420 versus the budget of 441, due to the cost containment measurements that we have applied, as well as uh, some of uh, the expenses that could not be executed in the current year due to the National Treasury instruction that came in February that uh, we must uh, not issue bids uh, above 30,000 from 16th of Feb. Now, the administrative expenditure was slightly below budget by 1.8. And uh, on the compensation of employees, uh, we are slightly below budget due to the fact that uh, we had the vacancies that were filled late in the year, as well as some of uh, the positions that were deferred uh, due to our liquidity challenges. On the operating expenditure, we are sitting at uh, a positive variance of uh, 10 million. In total, uh, for the year, we had an operating surplus of uh, 6.8 million. Last year, we had a deficit of uh, 16 million. The next slide, please. The next slide uh, indicates uh, our revenue. As you can see, Chair, in terms of uh, the government grant, uh, it's on par. And uh, the area where it's uh, below budget, it's on the government grant capital expenditure. And uh, this is mainly of two factors. Uh, one is because uh, this 30 million, it was received uh, in January, late in the year. And uh, around uh, 15, around the 16th of Feb, uh, we had uh, that uh, national treasury instruction which indicated that we cannot, we could not issue bids uh, from that period until uh, May 2022. Now, this contributed to this uh, um, capital expenditure variance. And uh, in terms of uh, the commercial revenue, on the statutory revenue, we have a positive variance of 8 million. The actual is 77 million. And this is mainly due to the fact that the aviation sector opened up and improved uh, um, in the last quarters of the year. However, I must still indicate that the 77 million, it's far below the 130 million that we saw it uh, in the period pre-COVID. And uh, we envisage that uh, with uh, the opening up of the economy, we will achieve the 130 million in the aviation industry around the year 2024-25. The non-statutory revenue was slightly below budget. We're sitting at 26.8 million, and uh, the variance is about 1.8 million. And uh, in terms of uh, the total revenue, we're sitting at 476 million versus the budget of 482, which is uh, 5.5 million below budget. And uh, slide uh, 30, 
indicates uh, our figures for the MTF period. The next uh, slide, Betty, please. It indicates uh, the next one. This slide indicates uh, our financial uh, uh, projections uh, or budget over the MTF period. As we can see in the slide, uh, we have uh, this amount of 124 million, which we are converting it from uh, government grant uh, CAPEX to government grant OPEX so that we can meet uh, our current liquidity challenges. This is a short term. A challenge that we experience or we've experienced due to the low aviation or low commercial revenue that we have experienced due to the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the low economic challenges. And we envisage that by 2024-25, the situation will have improved, whereby we will no longer need to have these conversions. And uh, Chair, just to add, the audit has been completed. We have received an unqualified audit report. We just had one audit finding, uh, which prevented us from- You achieving. had 20 minutes of your time already. You know, you've gone beyond your time. Can you wrap up and raise the issues that you feel are critical so that you can allow members to ask questions? Thanks. I thought you were going to be mindful that I given you extra time, but still you are going beyond that as well. Proceed. Sorry about the chair. Actually, mm -hmm. I was done. Sorry about the chair. So actually, I was done. I was just giving the feedback on the audit. Thanks very much, chair. I'm done. I believe that's the end of the presentation, chairperson and CEO. Can I get a yes? Yes, um, uh, yes, okay. uh, Chairperson. Okay, then let me thank you so much. Let me hand over to colleagues to ask questions. I'll start with Honorable Paulson, will be followed by Honorable Phillips and Honorable Kuno in that order. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Chairperson. And Brian will be the last. Thank you, Paulson. Over to you. Can we see you, please? <laughs> <laughs> Can oh, you see me now, dear person? Something else that we're seeing. Hey? Something else. Can you see me? We see red oh. and yellow. There we go. That's okay. better. Mm. Uh, uh, um, yeah. Person, I've got like a, a, a door on my camera so that I can close it and open it. <laughs> like a bathroom yes. door. Chairperson, uh, just one question, Chairperson. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Abada about um, the weather stations that are at risk and, uh, and how that has aff affected the operation of the South African Weather Services. Um, it could, because he hasn't he hasn't touched on that, and it's been in the media quite a lot. And and uh, I'd like to know uh, how many of those weather services are down or service stations are down. Uh, what has been the impact on the work of the South African weather services? It is especially. Sorry, Chairperson, I lost connection there for a while. Hello? Che? Yes, proceed. Yeah. So um, I'd like to ask Mr. Bada, um, how many weather stations have been down and how that has impacted on the operation of the South African weather services? I mean, it is especially in these times of climate change and sporadic weather conditions that we really need to have a a functional weather services. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you. Honorable Phillips? 
Oh, thank you so much, Chair. I, um, I've got just a few questions. I'd just like to know the ozone sons that were referred to, are those the same as the radio sons that were purchased? I think the contract was 26 million Rand. Um, that's my first question. My second question is um, the early warning radar that um, was uh, the project that was started in 2009 and um, finally finished in 2013. Of those radar stations that were opened and commissioned, which are still working and which are not working? And what is the reason for us not having all of them um, functioning at the moment? Uh, and then I'd just like to know if I could have a list of the air monitoring stations in Rustenburg, which is my constituency, I'd love to actually just pop around and, and visit them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Honorable Phillips. Honorable Mkulu, over to you. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. I've got just one question um, uh, to the CFO. Um, on the liquidity ratio of uh, uh, source, uh, in particular for the fourth quarter. Thank you. What is the liquidity ratio at the moment? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Mpuno. Honorable Bryant. Thanks, Chair. I, I think I'm covered a bit by um, Honorable Paulson, but uh, effectively the question is, uh, is the South African Weather Service confident that they would have the capacity to predict another large-scale weather event like we had last year, I'm sorry, earlier this year, um, with the current systems in place? Um, and um, yeah, that's that's pretty much me, Kevin. Thanks, Chip. Thank you, Honorable Brian. Let me check if there's somebody who am I missing. It doesn't look like. Then my issues, uh, Chairperson. Uh, uh, okay, sorry, Chairperson. Oh, sorry. Okay, proceed. No, no, I, no, I'm sorry. I put my hand up a bit late. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to know, just following on Honorable Brian, what lessons have the South African Weather Services learned? after the devastating floods of last year in terms of getting messages out adequately and, and timeously to people in areas that are prone to uh, flood damage? What have they done different? Are they doing anything different uh, from then to now? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Singh, for those questions. From my side, these are the issues that I want to get clarity uh, from you, Chairperson and CEO. Uh, when we see a presentation and read it, we, we pick up the reasons for meeting the 70% availability of radar infrastructures was attributed to improved electrical power and communication network and maintenance and refurbishment efforts continue to be implemented. This is what is written there in your report. And then the question that comes out of that is that could, it, could not this kind of routine work be done in past dispensation to meet this target, which we noted last year had become elusive from your part. And then I want to get the to get clarity as to when was the last time this target of radar infrastructure availability met a uh, CEO? When was it actually met? <laughs> because it keeps on going. And then the other issue that one wants to get clarity on is why plan only for 75% availability of priority areas, air quality stations, reporting data, on the South African air quality information systems, which again is not met. 
And then how do we then ensure that we are not missing critical information for protect, protecting human health from those air quality monitoring stations, which are not reporting, which are not reporting data on the South African air quality information system. Then one looks at the reason that has been stated for not meeting this target as to theft and, vandal and vandalism of three river station and damage transformer at Sewogain station. And then out of that, then one wonders whether a thought has gone into theft proofing this monitoring station, considering the recurring pattern of this practice. And then, Chairperson, I want to also understand how can we make this infrastructure economically unfeasible to potential thieves or criminals? And then the other issue that one had to look on was the target for unregulated commercial revenue, which was, was, was also not met for various reasons, including lower revenue from a quality related income. Then the question that arises out of that is that what kind of a quality related information or service does the South African weather services provide for money? And then which are those entities that pay for these services that the South African weather services provides? And then isn't that the current air quality information provided via the South African Air Quality Information System, part of the public good service paid for by governments. Maybe if we clarify that, we'll be able to understand that. And then the other issue that one want to get clarity from you, uh, Tim Sawis, it's what significant intervention did you put in place to reduce personnel attrition rates? Can this reduction be attributed to yourselves uh, being ingenuity or simply because people cannot afford to resign considering the prevailing COVID, post-COVID economic uh, conditions? So those are the issues that I want you to clarify from my side. Over to you, Chairperson and CEO. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. I'm going to ask the, the CEO to address some of the questions and also Mr. Ndambambi uh, to deal with the questions pertaining to the raiders. Uh, over to you, CEO. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, Chairs, uh, I, I think um, I just need to clarify. Um, uh, in terms of Honorable Paulson and Honorable Brian's questions, um, sorry, um, you can't see my face. Um, we, we, we have a variety of equipment that we use um, to measure um, weather. And in terms of the question around um, how many were down um, and, and the whole media issue um, related to the number of, of, of weather stations, I think just to contextualize that, um, Chair, um, the fuss in the media was in relation to the number of st uh, um, stations that we had and um, the, the fact that there was a drastic reduction in the number of stations. So to contextualize it, we've had um, in the past um, what we called manual stations, um, where um, literally a person used to go out and check the weather for us, check the rainfall for that particular day, and then report back um, to the weather services. And we had a, a, a fair number of those people reporting into the weather service. Um, and I think there were spikes, I think, in the 1930s and 1970s in terms of the numbers of stations. But I stand to be corrected there. And we can give um, a, a more comprehensive report on that should the, the committee require. But essentially, what, what we were doing or what we are doing is that we replaced a lot of those manual reporting stations with electronic stations or automatic stations. So, um, and, and there's a, a series of advantages to that. Um, 
Um, but just in terms of the manual stations, a lot of the farmers used to report um, and schools and, and stuff like that used to report um, the manual weather for us. And uh, subsequently, there was a lot of consolidation of these farms and some of the historical owners of those farms left. So we started um, having a bit of unreliability in terms of the provision of um, that weather information. Whereas with the um, uh, automatic weather stations, um, the quality of data as well as the frequency of data is much um, better. Um, and, and Mr. Ndabambi can correct me, I think it's an hourly um, uh, reporting or even less uh, on these automatic um, um, weather stations. Um, so, so definitely there's um, an advantage to having the automatic weather stations. So, um, and just in terms of the infrastructure, it's not only those weather stations. Um, we also have automatic um, rainfall stations. Um, we also use the um, radio suns, um, uh, the balloons, in other words, um, to help us with weather prediction. We also use satellite data for weather prediction, and um, we also use our radars. Um, so there's a range of information that gets put into the models that we then um, run to actually predict weather. So um, in, in terms of your concern, Honorable Paulson and Honorable Brian, um, yes, we can. Um, we also have international um, obligations in this regard with the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. And um, thus far, they have not raised any concern. So we, we're also meeting the international standards in terms of our um, um, pre um, weather prediction ability. Um, and we're also one of the um, sort of regional centers in Africa that do a lot of work uh, in conjunction with the WMO, um, both from a weather perspective and also from, from a climate change perspective. So um, they, they, they would have definitely raised the alarm if um, there were issues in relation to our um, uh, weather systems not being functional. Uh, but that notwithstanding, we do monitor them um, um, constantly. Um, in fact, um, uh, it also ties in with, I think it was question two um, of um, uh, Ms. Uh, Honorable Phillips' um, um, question uh, with regard to the radars. Um, so um, I think currently um, uh, there are of the, we have 10 S-band radars, um, we have two um, C-band and two X-band, if I recall correctly, um, Chair. Um, and of those um, 14, I think there's one that's currently, or two that are currently um, not operational um, in terms of my latest information. But once again, Mr. Dabambe will just indicate what the reasons for those um, uh, radar is not um, um, being available at the moment. Um, then uh, also in relation to the ozone suns and the radio um, and, and the radio suns, I think they, they measure different things, but um, Dr. Um, Pepia will be able to give us a bit more information on the ozone suns. And I think uh, Mr. Dabambi on the um, radio suns. Um, also, we will provide uh, Honorable Phillips with the um, stations that uh, are in or close to Rustenburg. Um, uh, then, um, Honorable Singh, in terms of the lessons that we learned after KZN, um, definitely um, there are, in fact, we had a, a, um, a workshop um, with uh, internally as well as with some of our international counterparts from Ethiopia on specifically that issue, Honorable Singh, excuse me, in terms of how we um, improve the dissemination of information. Um, and just in terms of some of the initiatives, um, we, we've engaged with the um, major cell phone operators. I think if I uh, recall correctly, and Dr. Mpepia will just confirm, We've, uh, two of them have indicated a willingness to assist us uh, in terms of, as you say, um, reaching a wider audience. Um, and I think there are numerous lessons that we, we have learned from um, the, the um, happenings there and, and particularly around um, some of the, the, the um, things that we'll need to take into the future from a 
a climate perspective, which is the increase in severe weather, and also um, the relationship between weather and, and planning, um, for example, because some of that devastation that, that happened there was um, planning related, and we'll have to factor that into our, our future building plans and so forth, um, uh, or rather um, the, the, the um, local authorities when they issue their building plans would have to take that into um, consideration. Um, then, Honorable Chair, your question around the radar infrastructure and why we had not um, done the routine work in the past. Um, Honorable Chair, we, uh, I explained to you that we had converted our capital expenditure over the last two years and, and this uh, for this financial year as well um, into operational expenditure. So that money should have been used for some of the routine work for some of our infrastructure. Um, but because we, we didn't have that money, um, the, we, we use that for operating expenses. And, um, you know, we couldn't do, as you put it, the, the routine work in relation to improving um, some of the infrastructure issues. However, um, we did get some money from the department um, and over the MTF, and that money is what we are using um, to fund some of these initiatives in terms of the new UPSs and um, uh, I can't remember the technical term for the machine, but it, it regulates the power surges to some of our equipment um, and that kind of thing. Um, then, um, in terms of our uh, priority area reporting, um, the difficulty there is that not all the air quality stations belong to us. Um, we have a certain number of stations that are under our control, and uh, Mr. Ndababi can indicate the, the actual numbers. Um, but um, your, your question specifically, I think, Chair, was uh, in relation to the theft and vandalism. I've, I've mentioned during my presentation that we're looking at moving them to safer locations, the ones that, that belong to us at the moment anyway. Um, and then how do we make it economically unfeasible? I, I think that's a difficult one, Chair, because um, these, we, we, in terms of alternatives, you also sometimes use solar panels, there's electrical cabling. Um, uh, so so um, it's all things that would um, uh, of necessity attract the criminal element because it's things that they can then sell off um, you know, for, for, for um, a bit of money. Uh, but but what we are trying to do there in terms of making it unfeasible feasible for them is moving them to more secure lo locations where access to these stations would not be as easy. Um, and then we also um, engaged uh, Chair with um, the um, SANDF who then referred us to the SAPS in terms of checking whether um, we can't declare some of them as national key points. Um, we've had a discussion with the SAPS um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and they've indicated that they would be prepared to do a security assessment for um, particularly our bigger infrastructure sites like our radar. Um, and even if, if they don't get declared as national key points, at least we'd have a good sense of the um, security issues in and around those sites. So we are definitely going to take them up on that because um, they, they do the assessment for us or that particular division of the SAPs would do the assessment for us and um, uh, they, they do it um, as part of um, their, their service to us. Then, Chair, you mentioned the issue around um, um, the, the public good services and commercial services. As um, we indicated, some of these services are, oh, sorry, these air quality stations don't all fall under our auspices. Some of them fall under um, uh, provincial governments and even local authorities. So some of our commercial endeavors um, relate to assisting as a service provider, some of these um, entities to ensure that their air quality stations are up and running. Um, so I know for a fact that we um, deal a lot with Mpumalanga in terms of assisting them to develop their air quality management plans and that kind of thing. And the reason that we charge for those services, Chair, is because um, a lot of these services are, are 
um, advertised and we tender for them just as other entities tender for them um, to, to provide for those services. And, and public sector, uh, sorry, the private sector um, usually carries out some of these functions for these entities. So that is the, the nature of the, the public, uh, sorry, the commercial services that we provide. Um, so it would be services that the private sector would ordinarily provide that we are capacitating ourselves. Um, and, and, and it goes hand in hand with that um, non-regulated uh, non commercial revenue aspect of, of what we were talking about in our presentation um, and, and how we improve that. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then in terms of the attrition rate, um, Chair, and I'll ask um, our um, acting corporate services uh, manager to maybe just um, elaborate a little bit, but um, when you mention attrition rate, um, Chair, it, it's a difficult situation because it's also finance related and we've already indicated our concerns around that. However, um, there are things that we are doing um, and, and we're trying to innovate in terms of that. So, we, for example, we, we're using the um, TITA CETA funding to, to fund some of our um, training um, because it's money that, 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 that's externally available. Um, we've developed or are in the process of developing also a comprehensive employee value proposition that has various elements, um, Chair, and among those are some non-financial elements that we can do uh, or can use um, to, to, to help prevent, um, you know, the loss of employees. But I just want to mention once again, Chair, that um, yeah, in this space, it's very difficult because our, our staff are scientific and technically orientated and they're in demand. Um, some of these skills are in demand from the private sector in the country. Um, other skills are in demand internationally. So we're losing some of our forecasters to other countries that, that um, don't have the capacity, but do have the financial ability to pay much more than we do. Um, and if you're paying in, in US dollars and pounds and Saudi rials, for example, um, you know, you, you're competing in a, not, not on a level playing field, shall I say. Um, but there, there are things like, for example, um, bursary schemes and employee recognition and so forth that we are implementing um, to try and improve our overall uh, employee value proposition chair. Um, Chair, I think I've dealt with all the issues. I'll then hand over to um, the executives, Mr. Dabambi, Mr. Dr. Mpepia, and then Ms. Makongolo, just to, to um, add if they think they want to add anything. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank, thank you, CEO. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. And uh, good afternoon, honorable members, uh, honorable deputy ministers, and the honorable chairpersons of the board. Uh, honorable chair, I think the one uh, I need to explain is the radar songs. I don't know, it's uh, uh, the radars uh, that were purchased around 2009, the members said so. So uh, which ones are not working? So there were 10 uh, S band radars. Uh, so those 10 S-band radars, uh, they're all uh, uh, operational. Uh, uh, currently, uh, there is one in MLO that is uh, uh, not working, but it's not uh, uh, due to the radar uh, problem. It's a transformer in the area uh, that has been uh, 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 stolen. So the municipality is handling the matter. But there were also two mobile radars uh, called expand radars, the ones uh, that were mobile and for the uh, short range less than 100 kilometers. Uh, those are apparently not working. Uh, the manufacturer has uh, identified a problem that is, uh, is, is it is being uh, analyzed. They are assisting us to analyze uh, uh, that problem. And then also uh, there's another question uh, regarding the list of uh, quality stations uh, in Rustenburg. So th those stations in Rustenburg, they are not under uh, the responsibility of the South African Weather Service, uh, but there are two air quality uh, stations uh, in the Rustenburg uh, uh, area. Uh, so 
I, I think they, they are still having a, a challenge, uh, but we have not been asked uh, as a South African Weather Service uh, uh, to assist, as we have been asked by the Mpumalanga province as the CEO has uh, uh, alluded uh, uh, to. Uh, and then uh, the air quality stations that are, are not uh, rep reporting to South African air quality uh, information uh, system. Uh, so we need, uh, we are busy with the department, we are encouraging the industry and also our assisting municipalities uh, so that they, they report to the information system. So what uh, we are doing, we are hosting the air quality information system but it's upon uh, the industries that they make sure that uh, they, they report there. So the department keeps promoting awareness uh, and encouraging uh, the industry. Uh, I think those, uh, what I pick, uh, unless I've missed the one you didn't cover, I think CO has covered uh, uh, most of the infrastructure areas. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Okay. The CFO. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, one item on the liquidity ratio. We are sitting at 0 0.99 versus one, and the benchmark is two to one. Basically, it's one to one. Thank you, Chair. Okay, got it. I see the end of, oh, Peter, you want to say something, Mr. Lucky? Thank you, Chair. Just a quick one to um, Honourable Phillips uh, on the question she asked about her uh, monitoring near where she stays, uh, around Rustenburg. Um, although the, the question has been answered around uh, the, the stations that um, South African Weather Station uh, Service looks after, there are um, stations in the area, as, was, as has been mentioned. And I was just suggesting that to, to Honourable Phillips that if she downloads the SACWIS app to her phone, she can get basically the, the closest weather station to where she is and exactly what the readings are on a real-time basis as well. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm just trying to make a, a bit of a plug for one of the, the systems that we have on an app uh, that basically talks about air quality in South Africa. Thank you, Chair. And then, who's Zaleka Makongolo? I see the end, it's up. Thank you, Honorable Chair. My name is Zoleka Makongolo. Uh, let me just show the video a bit. Um, my name is Zoleka Makongolo. I was the Acting Corporate Services Executive Source. I just want to add to what... Um, now, the... what are you now? You were acting um, now. What are you... In the reporting period. So I am currently the Senior Manager, H HR. Oh, I just wanted to... Executive... Now there's an executive that is appointed to this position, if I may ask. Yes, she started in two, two, two or three weeks ago, Chair. Oh, is she seen, she's seen the meeting? She is in the meeting. Oh, okay, proceed. Okay, so just to add, Chair, to what you had um, indicated on the employee turnover and to add to what the CO has indicated, we conducted exit interviews and used that information together with the bench, market benchmark to develop a source a talent strategy that clearly articulated our employee value proposition and included in there was the retention strategy. This was presented to the employees together with the plan and it was well presented by the, I mean, well received by the employees. And we continue then to present quarterly reports in terms of our progress to the board. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Zoleta. Honorable Sin, the end is up. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you for the responses. This, just just uh, one or two follow-up questions. You know, my, my hobby horse is uh, pollution. And uh, I've mentioned that, you know, when you watch the news sometimes in other countries, they, they, they advertise the pollution indices. Uh, 
how, how much of pollution is in a particular city. And I know India does that. Now, moving forward, will it be possible as a way of letting communities know, particularly in the areas where we know there are high levels of pollution, and we know there are serial offenders, some of them being state-owned enterprises, like in the Pumalanga area. Is it possible for the South African Weather Services to determine what the pollution indices are there and advertise that publicly so that people know, uh, you know what pollution levels are in their particular areas? That's the first question. The second, the second issue will, will, will relate to, to what extent does load shedding impact on your ability to produce, uh, uh, you know, weather results and uh, uh, weather patterns, et cetera? Does it affect you at all? And last one related to this is, you know, when you watch the news, you find that the news ends, particularly on our public broadcaster, and then the, the weather is by the way. With, with, with the department, uh, your departments, our departments, uh, branding on it. I might have asked this question before somebody. Do those radio stations and public broadcasts and everybody who uses the information from weather services pay weather services or does weather service pay them to broadcast and advertise the weather? Thanks. Yes, Chairperson and Tim. Those are the final I'll hand over to the CEO to, to address the question. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I think that, um, Honorable Singh, that um, app um, would be the um, what, what Peter was referring to earlier. Because um, I think the, the app gives you a clear indication of, of where the, the potential hotspots are, and it gives you um, a good indication of the pollution levels in and around particular areas. So as he indicated, where we do have stations, you'd be able to determine um, what the, the, the pollution um, levels are, particularly for um, um, various um, pollutants. And um, I, I, I don't want to um, hazard a guess in terms of all of them, but I think it was PM10, PM2.5, um, um, carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, um, and there's a whole range of, of, of um, um, potential pollutants that, that get reported on, um, if, I, if my memory serves me correctly. But um, Peter can maybe just add um, if, I, if I've missed out something. Um, Honorable Singh, yes, load shedding does impact us um, very, very badly. Um, in a few ways. Um, okay, so the first is obviously without power, the um, um, some of our, our equipment goes down. Um, hence, we've started this initiative to, to um, make sure that we have uninterruptible um, power supplies there. We're also looking at battery backups um, um, as well in some instances. But the, the, the bigger problem, Honorable Singh, is that sometimes when we have load shedding and we have power surge, and that because these instruments are, are very technical and very sensitive in terms of measuring capabilities, a lot of, a lot of times when the, the, cow, sorry, the power comes back on, um, it impacts on the, the, the calibration of some of these instruments and also impacts on the, on the reliability of some of them. So we've got to recalibrate in some instances or it, in some instances it totally takes out the instrument uh, in terms of its measuring ability. Then we've got to respond to that and, and fix that. Um, so yes, it definitely does does affect us. Um, um, and as you can see, um, like uh, the, Mr. Ndabambi mentioned, um, the the transformer that got stolen um, that is basically impacting one of our radars. And um, so so because there's no electricity in the area, the radar goes down. Um, so um, it, it definitely does impact on us. Um, and then um, in terms of the um, the weather, it's um, Honorable Singh, we have a dual mandate and that dual mandate is um, firstly public good. So a lot of what you see um, on the um, um, news stations and, and, and radio stations and all that is, is the public good service part of, of, of our services. So there's no um, payment per se. Um, in terms of that, we do have commercial customers like, for example, um, the insurance companies and so forth that, that we then sell 
um, product to specifically. So that's over and above the public good. Um, so so um, th there's no payment as such for, for those kind of, of services, uh, Honorable Singh. Recording in progress. In the Northwest, and those that are not coming in siege are down Tuesday. Next week, the meeting gets urgent. Enjoy the rest of your day and the week. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Recording stopped. Thank you, Chairperson. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank